So let's talk Skitari Servitors and the Zealous Tech Priest of the Omnisire, tuning your data tethers for a review of the core rules of Codex Adeptus Mechanicus. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Abmech, and in this video we're going to do a complete review of the match play rules of the Codex, the core rules for putting a Mechanicus army on the board. So far in 10th edition, Admech haven't had as good a time of it as plenty of other factions out there. Their rules really were quite underpowered at the edition's launch, and despite a bunch of points changes and points cuts, I feel like they weren't really in a place that many people wanted them to be recently. Their performance wasn't terrible at tournaments, being sort of mid-table within 40k factions, but they do feel kind of reliant on just a few key units to get that, maybe most notably spam of Cataphron Breachers. Hopefully that changes now to at least some extent though, the new codex will bring a bunch of different attachments and a lot of small tweaks and optimizations to some data sheets, and fingers crossed between all that it breathes some life into the faction. The overall content of the book is pretty similar to other 40k codexes so far, there's the lore and miniature galleries, detailing the background of the faction, and lots of nicely painted Mechanicus miniatures, which while they can often take a long time to paint, I do think look rather spectacular on the tabletop. There's a Crutet's content section for playing your forces in that game mode for the narrative play, and the Combat Patrol rules section, that one featuring the rules for the new box with the Tavaxi and the Sulphur Hounds in Purge Core Deltic 9. I strongly suspect that that one will also be available as a digital download for free in the very, very short future. As normal with my reviews though, I'm going to focus on the core rules for the book, the actual rules for playing any Mechanicus army in games of Warhammer 40k, with their core rule, datasheet and attachments. Their core rule remains Doctrina Imperatives, which is basically unchanged, either the Advance and Shoot or the Heavy keyword, plus a few AP things with deployment zones. There's now 5 detachments in the book, each with a primary special rule, 4 enhancements and 6 stratagems, the Rad Zone 1 returns but has a boosted rule, and then there's a Skitari Hunter Cohort, a Cohort Cybernetica, an Explorator Maniple, and a Data Sarm Conclave themed around the Cult Mechanicus forces. Then of course there's all the rules for the models themselves, there are 30 data sheets in this book with some new and updated rules on them, several of them have had their special abilities changed around in one way or another, and there is a bit of movement on new and removed ones, there's the new data sheets for the Sidonian Scatros, the Admech Sniper units, the classic servitors with the servo arms and multi melters have gone away, but in their place Games Workshop have separated out the Dragoon datasheet, you can now fill the Radium Jezel one as a different datasheet to the Taser Lance one, which seems reasonable enough to give you better options for special rules. And finally, while there is a point section in the book, it's not going to be confirmed one way or the other at time of recording. We'll know the Admech points when Games Workshop unleashes the Munitorum Field manual download for us, and if it follows the same sort of pattern as the Tyranids and the Space Marine books, that should probably come sometime within the next week or so. I'll certainly aim to cover it on the channel so I can talk about the points with full knowledge and not just be guessing. Until that point though, we're not going to know how strong the army is, if Games Workshop keeps the points cost the same, I feel like not much strength is going to be gained potentially, just maybe having more options for how to play the army in a more credible way. Obviously if they put down some points on some key units, it definitely could make them a lot stronger, though that might cause issues in itself, making Mechanicus units even cheaper in points, but still costing the same. Jumping into the rules properly though, let's start out with the Doctrina Imperatives, then we'll go through the detachments and then the data sheets. The Doctrina Imperatives are pretty much unchanged from the Index offering, you either have the choice between putting your army in the Protector Imperative or the Conqueror Imperative each battle round. It is declared at the start of the battle round and not in your command phase, as that makes a bit more sense for allowing the Protector 1 to protect your units against enemy attacks if you went first. Again, unfortunately, due to the law of these, they are very much restricted to a subset of datasheets within the Codex, so it's the Skitari units and the Cataphron Servitors that get these, the Tep Priests, Electro Priests, and the Castellan Robots don't, but the Castellan Robots can pick it up from the Cybernetica cohort if you take that particular formation. It still is a bit unfortunate to have the main army rule only locked to a subset of Codex units, even if it is quite a big one. I guess due to what they're trying to go for, it's just the law of the Tet Priest programming in their minions, so it doesn't really make sense for anything Tet Priest or Electro Priest to be programmed as such. As before, the two options are the Protector Imperative and the Conqueror Imperative. Protector gives your entire army the heavy keyword, most things hit on a 4 plus at base, so this would usually have them hitting up on a 3 plus if they remain static, 
And also if your unit happens to be within your own deployment zone, then you get a minus one AP debuff against enemy attacks targeting them. Both rules are definitely good rules. In reality, with the heavy keyword though, it's always going to be a bit of a painful decision to not be moving on. It might depend a little bit on just how much terrain that you tend to play with, but certainly in more dense competitive boards, you're not often able to just stand still and shoot and get full effect. You might need to be moving to get line of sight or range or just get towards objectives and things. I'd probably see this as a slightly less interesting option. The minus one AP debuff could genuinely be quite good early game, I guess, though. If your opponent does wind up going first and you do have lots of things that they can shoot that is going to be relevant to get that AP debuff on. Otherwise, the other one is the Conquer Imperative. This one gives you the Assault keyword on it, all the ranged weapons borne by these units. For the most part, I'd say that this one will be the one I'd see as the default, getting an extra D6-inch move on every shooting unit every time they want to move around, I think is kind of great. More likely to be able to get line of sight on enemies or get to objectives or things like that. In addition, it also gives you an AP boost against enemies that are within their deployment zone. And due to it being within, not wholly within, like the protector one, anything just towing into the deployment zone will still be eligible for that debuff. Extra AP can definitely be relevant on a lot of Admech weapons as well, things like the Castellan Phosphor Blasters, or the Taraxe Phosphor Torches, or plenty more. I would probably see the Assault as the primary benefit though. Overall, I would say that it's a meaningful faction rule. As said, I'd probably see the Conqueror as the standard one. Unless on any one turn it does make more sense to have Protector and more durability and stand and shoot, it does tend to be an option that you want to use on some turns in some games. Besides being locked just literally to a subset of the army though, it does get targeted to an even more niche subset within that, as both of these rules are really quite range focused, so it means that you're not really getting much benefit from them for the units that want to be charging forward and winding up in melee. It just means that even within the slightly dedicated unit pool that you're already using to get the best advantage of these, things like the Sidonian Dragoons with the Taser Lances and the Rust Stalkers aren't going to get so much benefit, not outside of quite niche situations. Overall, I still say it's not awful. It is an impactful faction rule, but maybe not quite as much as some other armies out there, potentially. Moving on to perhaps the most exciting bit of the Codex update, we have the Detachments. And as normal for these 40k Codex ones, the general principles are that they don't actually forbid you from using any one unit in any one army. Literally, you can take any collection of Admech models and run them in any detachment, but in reality, depending on your collection, it depends. You might be very incentivized to take one over another, or just to not take one of them if you don't have units with that keyword. Going through the five different detachments as a general overview, the Rad Zone Core is a generalist one with the Bombardment Special Rule that's got a bit better. It has taken a couple of hits to other options, including the Return Fire Stratagem and the Omni Sterilizer, though, sadly. The Explorator Manipur is the other fairly generalist one. This one focuses around Tepri's hunting for artifacts, so you nominate an objective marker and get big boosts for trying to take down that marker, but it does mean that quite a lot of units are kind of interesting with it. Then, getting more specialist, there's the Skitari Hunter Cohort. That one specialises with Skitari and Skitari infantry specifically. It has several stealth tricks and a few abilities for redeployments and infiltration and hiding units from shooting and things. There's the Cohort Cybernetica, that one's primarily aimed at Castellan robots but also has quite a lot of support for vehicle units. All the stratagems are sort of programmed in an advance, you only get to use them in your command phase to generally add more power of one sort or another to different facets of your army. And finally there's the Data Sarm Conclave, that one's focused on the Court Mechanicus type units, so the Cataphron Servitors, the Electro Priests and the Tech Priests pretty much. Just from an initial read, I wouldn't say that any of them seem to be absolutely standout strong or standout weak. It might depend a bit on just how strong certain data sheets are. Say, for example, if Cult Mechanicus or Castellan Robot data sheets get super powerful, then those specific detachments could be extra good. But otherwise, I'd say that Rad Zone Explorator and Skitari Hunter Cohort all look pretty playable. The other two maybe just being a little bit niche and requiring some really quite specific armies to get the most out of them, as if you don't have either loads of Castellan robots or loads of the Cult Mechanicus things, you might well be better with something else. Let's jump into the detachments properly though, and first up we have the Explorator Maniple. This is the one that represents tech priests going on missions to retrieve some hidden Archaeotech, and the primary rule allows you to nominate one acquisition marker in your command phase, and then basically the rest of your army is going to get big boosts either standing on that objective or destroying any enemy units that are on it themselves. 
as well as just the core rule, it has quite a lot of benefits for the stratagems and enhancements, and there is one stratagem that allows you to nominate a second acquisition marker each turn. So provided you do budget CP for it, you could have that in play on two out of the say five or six markers on the board typical at a 2000 point game. The primary rule for the acquisition marker is a small damage boost one. If your units are either on an acquisition marker or their attacks are targeting an enemy unit that's on an acquisition marker, you get to reroll ones to wound. I guess that means in theory you could have a home field objective set up as a bit of a Skitari firebase or something. Potentially lots of units towing onto that objective, getting big damage boosts. Or you could nominate an objective marker that the enemy's got some powerful units on, and basically make them easier to kill for anything in your army that can target them. Overall, reroll ones to wound usually amass out to be a plus 17% damage boost, so it's okay but not super meaningful, and it will be redundant for a few units that get twin-linked things, say like twin-linked las cannons of Iron Strider Ballastari. Still though, as a core rule, I think it's solid enough. It definitely will add up to more damage across a game. For the stratagems, first up we have Reactive Safeguard. This one is one that allows you to jump back into a transport marker if your unit's on an acquisition marker and then was charged. I guess in theory maybe you could have some Skitari Vanguard that were on the point and then jump back into the transport when the enemy comes to try and reclaim it. Between this one and one of the other stratagems, it might make sense to have at least some dune riders taking some infantry units towards the points in the midfield. This one really is quite specific though, you need to have the transport and both the units intact and not just get shot dead, and they need to be on your acquisition point, and it needs to make sense to actually have them jump back in the transport rather than just stay on the objective, with the objective control points that you're usually going to want on objectives. Probably not really the strongest strength boost as a result of all that. For 1 CP there's cached acquisition which will often be a trade for CP for victory points. This happens when you have a Mechanicus unit that's slain on an objective that you control. That point remains under your control until your opponent can take it at the start or end of any turn. That one's probably going to be best if you have a fragile unit that's gone down on a point that you hold. That means that you might literally just be able to score say 5 primary points literally for 1 CP. If the opponent doesn't have any units that are close enough to take it, definitely a nice one to have, doesn't really add raw power but will add some points from time to time. For one command point there's Info Slave Skull, this is the one that allows you to nominate a second objective marker, to be able to nominate it you need to have a tech priest on the board and to be within 24 inches of the point that you want to nominate. You do it in the command phase and the tech priest doesn't necessarily need to be able to see the marker or anything like that, you can just do it. Given that quite a lot of the other options for the detachment revolve around being able to use acquisition markers, getting two per turn does seem good. It might not be worth it literally every turn though. For 2 CP there's Auto Oracular Retrieval. This one's the other one that might help out units that were transported. This one gives you a plus one to wound in your shooting phase for a unit that got out of a transport and then shoots something on your acquisition marker. The damage boost is definitely okay but at 2 CP I feel like that's not super high value really. I guess it could be alright for mass spammed strength 5 corpus gari shots perhaps, or maybe the cluster of special weapons out of rangers or vanguard, but for 2 CP for that I feel like it's not generally going to be the best deal. For 1 command point there's incense exhaust, an infantry unit within 6 inches of an Amex smoke unit can both gain the benefits of stealth and benefit of cover, basically this one is a boosted smoke stratagem, it means that you can get stealth and cover on both units rather than just one for 1 CP, and that does generally seem like it could be quite a nice option. It could target things like Cataphrons for that, so that could be minus one to hit for them and the benefit of cover, plus also for a vehicle nearby. Maybe something like an Onager Dune Crawler or Iron Strider Ballastari, which have the smoke keyword now. That one seems high value, particularly if both units are going to be shot, and it's quite a nice defensive option. Finally, for 1 CP, there's Priority Reclamation. Again, this is a kind of situational one where an Admech unit consolidates 6 inches, provided it ends that move on your acquisition marker, and you can't do it at all if there's enemy units within 3 inches. Again, this one is one that might just potentially just be trading command points for victory points, as your unit can move towards the points, and then hopefully claim it for your next turn. In reality though, again, I feel like this one is just so ridiculously niche. I feel like if you're charging and wiping out an enemy unit that's near an objective, there's at least a reasonable chance that you might have been able to get on that objective anyway. And the presence of any enemy units nearby do kind of ruin it. Could be one to look out for to see whether or not it's worth trying to attempt for, but I feel like it's kind of unlikely to go off in the first place. And again, just seems rather niche and very situational. I must admit I'm not sure that it's one of the strongest stratagem sections out there. 
I suspect that perhaps the best idea as a result might just be to put a whole load of command points into that info slave skull and getting multiple acquisition markers on the go. Otherwise cached acquisition is definitely nice to have as I feel like that will come up from time to time and incense exhaust I think is alright as a durability boost basically allowing you the option of smoke for cataphrons which are often a unit that's going to be taking big damage. Finally we've got the Explorator Manipal Enhancements and it did quite please me that these get the old Holy Order names from the Psychic Awakening supplement for Admech so Genitor, Logi, Majos and Artisan. All of these are Tech Priest only so I guess it's going with the idea of Tech Priest leading forces into battle so you can't take these on Skitari Marshals or the Sidodian Scatros but that's perhaps not the end of the world. These are genuinely quite powerful but do unfortunately mean that you need to be on your acquisition marker to actually get buffs or target an enemy unit that's on it so it does mean that you really have to play very closely to the objectives to get them active. Genitor gives you a 4 plus invulnerable save for the unit if they're on the acquisition marker. Unless it's cheap it maybe feels a little bit on the mediocre side for say Skitari or Electro Priest but I suppose if it is cheap and you have the character in them anyway then getting extra survivability isn't the worst. Could be pretty big for a Cataphron squad though fighting against some high AP shooting. The Lotus one is a nice damage dealer one for I guess moving out units to the midfield and taking enemy things. You get a plus one to hit against enemy units that are on acquisition markers that feels quite nice on anything that you could attach to. Cataphron Servitors getting a plus one to hit with both shooting and then also fighting seems rather nasty. Seems like you could have some pretty scary stuff coming out of breaches there. That one also feels like it could be fun for the Castellan robots as well. Plus one to hit with them at both range and melee is good. The Majos one is a rare bit of Admech command point farming. If you're on your acquisition marker you have a four plus chance to gain a one command point bonus in your command phase. If you're doing the strategy of just trying to mark two acquisition markers per turn. I guess this one could give you a good chance of refunding it if you had a tech breeze with this sat on your home objective. Feels like this could be alright on something like an engine seer supporting some fire base vehicles sat on the home field. Finally there's the artisan one which does seem like quite a nice boost. When a bear is leading the units and it's on your acquisition marker, once per vase you can change a hit or wound roll or a saving throw to a 6 and this feels like it would have some very solid damage boosts across the game. Say if you had that for a Dominus then you could flip a 6 to a Volkite Devastating Wound perhaps and whenever the unit gets attacked if it's on your acquisition marker if you can flip a dice to an automatic 6 that's guaranteed damage saved right then and there. If that could be active for a turn or two I'm sure it would have enough value to justify itself even if it does wind up costing a bit. Overall I feel like the Explorator one is interesting enough to have some people attracted to it. I feel like maybe the stratagems are a bit of a letdown though. I feel like all these enhancements are pretty interesting really and the detachment rule is handy enough just for a bit of raw extra damage and I guess just maybe go in with trying to mark multiple acquisition markers per turn and maybe use the one to get some smoke or automatic victory points if your unit gets gunned down and the enemy can't take the objective. Next up we come to the Cohort Cybernetica. In the lore this formation basically represents one of the oldest sub-branches of the Adeptus Mechanicus dating all the way back to 30k and before. These are the branches of the cults of the Omnissi that are responsible for deploying the battle automata onto the field. Semi-independent machine minds that are controlled with rigid protocols and perhaps as close as they can be to independent robots in 40k without committing grave tech heresy. The Mechanicus definitely don't want the Men of Iron getting loose once more. In the 30k setting there's many different variants of automata but in 40k currently there's just the one with these Castellan robots. Hopefully at some point Games Workshop get round to releasing a few more. It would be cool for the Admech to have a little bit more variety. The primary rule for the detachment is that Legio Cybernetica models get access to the Doctrina Imperatives. A Legio Cybernetica models are literally just the Cybernetica Datasmith and the Castellan robots, no other units within the Codex. Though the detachment itself is quite a lot more broad reaching than just these guys, basically it's trying to make itself the detachment that gives loads of support to Ammech vehicles with a lot of stratagems and enhancements that can help them. I must admit it is a bit weird to just have a full detachment rule that only gives your main army special rule to one unit within that army. Though I guess at least in other detachments the Castellan robots aren't actually costed to have it I guess. And in the new codex they did get a bit stronger with a few datasheet improvements though we still have to wait to see their points values. As for what the Doctrina imperatives offer them though you're basically getting either the heavy or the assault keyword depending on whether you're picking the conqueror or protector one. 
and you also get the secondary benefit of the AP stuff that you get, make ranged attacks at enemies in their deployment zone, and you get an extra pip of AP against them. If the enemy shoots you when you're in your deployment zone, then you worsen the AP of their attacks, and I guess that is pretty relevant with big 2 plus save threats like this. I'd say for the most part for the Castell and Robots, you're probably going to want to give them the Assault keyword via the Conqueror one, that means they can stride forward to then get those melee fists into combat as fast as possible and still keep up a lot of fire with the Phosphor Blasters or Incendine Combuster. I'd say that probably the only time that you'd actually want to go into the Protector Doctrine for the Castell and Robots alone would be if the enemy gets turn 1 and it is going to make the difference between them saving on a higher saving throw. If the enemy is firing a bunch of AP1 or AP2 stuff into your deployment zone then that could be a massive deal with their 2 plus saves and worsening their AP by 1. I feel like just with the detachment rule, it is making you really want to play heavy with these guys, and you could take literally 12 of these in an army if you wanted to. So I guess that would be 1200 points worth of Castell and Robots in a 2k list at time of recording, plus maybe some other vehicles for the other synergies. It is a bit of a shame for getting literally nothing for other vehicles in the army though, at least no other passive benefits. Moving on to stratagems, and the formation has 6 of them. Interestingly enough, these ones are very heavily themed, whereas most armies might have stratagems that work in different phases or in your opponent's turn, literally all of these are buffs that apply in your own command phase, and they all can only target either vehicle units or Legio Cybernetica, though I guess it's kind of redundant as Legio Cybernetica units are vehicle units for a lot of them. I guess it's trying to theme with programming your army to act in a certain way before it goes out to fight the enemy, though it does mean that you don't really get many reactive tricks or other special moves that you can pull, a lot of it's just about adding in raw power of one sort or another. For 1 CP there's auto divinatory targeting, a battle tactic one, this one you nominate a robot or vehicle for and one objective marker, and then that unit can only shoot things on that objective. The unit's ballistic skill becomes a 3+, plus, and that means that it can stack with the heavy keywords to have your unit hitting on a 2+, plus if it makes sense. On top of that, the attacks also get to ignore cover. I guess for that one you want to try and use it on the biggest scariest vehicle unit that's going to have the most impact, and I guess ideally have it against a unit that's going to get cover otherwise to actually make that bit relevant. And I guess if it does amount to hitting on a 3+, plus or a 2+, plus and then getting extra AP, you might genuinely improve the damage enough that it's worth it enough. I guess for this it's probably either going to be Castell and Robots, the Iron Striders with Las Cannons, or perhaps a Scorpius Disintegrator. Seems like an okay use of 1 CP. Feels like it might just always be something that's just plugged in for a little bit of extra damage though, maybe not truly game changing. For 1 CP, perhaps one of my favourite ones is Motive Imperative. This one is another command phase one, as they all are. One vehicle unit adds plus 3 to the move and plus 1 to advance and charge. Really quite a big overall boost in threat range there. It's very nice for Dragoons as they can move, advance and charge just at base with their Taser Lance loadout. And that means they could get some pretty ridiculous charges off there, but pretty nice for the Castell and Robots as well. If you do want to try and threaten the charge on something that otherwise would be a very long distance away, then the difference between them just being able to do a bit of shooting and then falling short with all those big punchy Castell and Fists, or being able to get into combat with the thing could be quite a big one. Feels like definitely one to consider as you're closing in. For 1 CP, there's Machine Spirit Resurgent. This one's a command phase one for a Legio Cybernetica or a vehicle unit that's below starting strength. If you're below starting strength, then you get to re roll the hit rolls, and if you're below half strength, then you get to re roll wound rolls as well. Again, I describe this one as a bit of a middling damage buff. I feel like you might get most out of it for, say, a unit of Castellans that's going to fire off a whole bunch of Phosphor Blasters and then also make a charge after that. Or perhaps seems particularly nice if you have a Scorpius Disintegrator that gets into the spot where it's below half health but not actually quite destroyed, getting four rerolls to hit and wound with all the Ferronite Cannon and the Disintegrator missiles does seem rather good. I feel like it's maybe kind of similar value to the Auto Divinatory one, two different options for just turning on extra damage in different situations. Next up for 1 CP there's Machine Superiority, as always in the command phase, and you nominate one vehicle or Legio Cybernetica unit, that unit can fall back and shoot, and you get to ignore modifiers to characteristics aside from saving throws this turn. Access to fall back and shoot can be really quite disruptive for the enemy, it means they can't rely on making you have hard choices with your vehicles, and if there's something that just doesn't make sense to remain in combat with because you want the rest of your army to shoot it, or you don't want it to risk killing you in the fight phase, then this one's always an option. The ignoring modifiers thing could be good in its own right, maybe if you had an enemy unit that had say stealth and a minus one to wound going on, then that could lead to some serious extra damage boost in the right circumstance as well. 
For one CP, there's Transcendent Cogitation. This one's a Command Phase 1, and it affects a Legio Cybernetica or Vehicle Unit. That unit can gain access to both the Conqueror and Protector Doctrina rather than just one of them. And I guess that one would usually be best used to just make sure that your units can get the other one aside from the one that you've selected at base. Say for example if you had a lone Scorpius Disintegrator sat in your deployment zone and you activated the Conqueror Doctrina for the rest of your army, that one could also give it the Protector one so it would have the AP debuff against enemy shooting and plus one to hit via heavy. I guess alternatively if you went second and you decided to go Protector to worsen enemy AP then it means that you could still have one unit that gets to advance and shoot and get the extra AP in the enemy deployment zone. In general I'd usually see it as just getting the extra Doctrina. I guess it's not really all that often that you're going to be able to get the advantage of both parts of it. The Heavy and the Assault are mutually exclusive. I suppose you might be able to get all three of the other buffs though potentially in the right situation, though it would be a bit niche. Finally for 1 CP we've got Benevolence of the Omnisire. Again it's declared in the command phase which I think is kind of unhelpful for this one really. It's a 6 plus feel no pain for your nominated unit, or 5 plus feel no pain against mortal wounds. I feel like this one more than any of them might have been more helpful if you could just declare it when the enemy actually attacks your unit so you know they're actually going to. You can't say declare this to reactively ward off a thousand sons doom bolt or something. And even the mortal wound bit of it is a bit more niche than it used to be given that devastating wounds are no longer mortal wounds. In itself I don't think the 6 plus feel no pain is generally going to be all that worth it unless you're planning to lose a serious amount of vehicle wounds next turn. I guess maybe if you've got a big tanky 4 man unit of Castellan robots that you know is going to take the absolute entirety of the enemy firepower then I guess it could just about have enough worth there perhaps. Again certainly not unusable, it is going to add a little bit more to your defence but for 1 CP I'd say that this one rarely is going to add up to much. Overall for the stratagems I feel like basically all of them are usable enough and each give you small boosts. I feel like most of them are very unlikely to actually ever deliver you an enormous win compared with your opponent. It does seem to be a detachment that's just going to give you small gains in one way or another and it's going to be a bit more boring and predictable maybe than some other detachments out there. Loads of different ways that you could get extra damage in one way or another. I think in particular I do like that extra movement one though, giving yourself an extra long charge range with those fighty Castellans or the Dragoons I think is well worth it if it makes the difference of you making a charge reliably. Otherwise for the enhancements they're all Tech Priest only, so I guess no giving these to things like this Guitarian Marshal or that new Sidonian Scatros. Currently we don't know the points cost for these enhancements yet, Games Workshop's going to publish the points cost online in the coming week, though I think already you can have a pretty good idea as to which ones are looking good or not. The one that looks like the single best one in my opinion is Necromechanic. This one basically cancels a failed save for one of your robots or vehicles within 12 inches. The damage characteristic is modified to zero, which can be kind of enormous if you had, say, a really big damage hit come through, maybe something like a flat damage 6 from a Necron Heavy Destroyer. Well, I guess the dream would be to thwart something like a Tau Railgun or a Guard Vanquisher Cannon. Even if this one is one of the most expensive enhancements in 40k, it would still be worth it. Just theoretically, even if, say, you had a Castellan robot take a failed save against a Laz Cannon, that'd be saving around about 4 or 5 wounds on average, and that roughly maths out to be 63 points worth of Castellan robot, so you've likely made your value back then and there, never mind if you manage to do that on more than one turn. Given that this arm is going to be vehicle heavy, otherwise you wouldn't be bothering with it, this basically looks auto-include to have either a new firebase or advancing up the board. Otherwise, there's a motionless clarity. This one is an interesting one that allows you to auto-explode a vehicle or robot each turn within 12 inches. When the opponent destroys it, it automatically triggers its deadly demise. In general, I do quite like these auto-explode rules, but for this one, just to commit to it pre-game seems a little bit premature, and then you've got to hope that your tech priest is alive and the vehicle's in a good position when it goes down, otherwise you might just not want to. Kind of annoyingly as well, the things that usually want to get closest to the enemy are the Castellans and the Dragoons, and they only have a deadly demise of one, so any gains from that are going to be kind of limited. I guess if that manages to splash around on a few different enemy units, though, it could still be worth it if this is really cheap. Otherwise I guess it could be nice enough for a unit that just jumped out of a dune rider perhaps if you can get the transport into the enemy army and then hopefully have it die somewhere when they can attack it and it's going to affect multiple units I guess that would be d3 wounds all around and I guess the same could go for some of the archaeopters playing a bit more aggressively. It seems fun and could be a nice to have though I feel like unless it costs a very cheap amount and it's not really worth bothering with. Otherwise we've got Lord of Machines this is a kind of disappointing once per turn debuff, 
you have to be fighting an enemy vehicle army, then the enemy player has to have chosen to put that unit within 12 inches of your character, and then that vehicle needs to have some meaningful firepower they want to use in the shooting phase. If the vehicle is within 12 inches of the bearer and visible to it, then when it shoots it needs to take a leadership test. If it passes the test, then it still is minus one to hit, but if it fails the test, then it can't shoot at all. The debuff is usually just going to be mildly annoying, but occasionally it could be absolutely massive if, say, you prevented something like an Imperial Knight from shooting. This one's just really matchup dependent, though, and really positioning dependent, and assuming your opponent isn't going to try and avoid it. Again, if it's absolutely ridiculously cheap, then it could be an okay one to maybe throw on a Cybernetica Datasmith with some Castell and robots moving forward, but other than that, again, it's not one of the ones that would attract me to the detachment. Finally, we've got one called Arc Negator or Negator. This one is a bit more of a nice simple one, and ranged weapons gain anti-vehicle 4 plus for the bearer, though it doesn't do anything for their unit. It kind of feels like this one is wanting to try and be the Omni Sterilizer, but for vehicles. Probably the two most interesting are either the Dominus's Volkite gun, which would usually do something like two to four mortal wounds due to devastating wounds on that one, or the Manipulus's Transonic Cannon, which would be a bit more reliably like four mortal wounds. If you've got one of those two running around in the army, then this seems absolutely reasonable to put on it, provided it's not super expensive. Again, it wouldn't really matter in every single game, but I guess their shooting is alright against infantry in the first place. Having them acting as an extra bit of anti-tank hidden in the lines could be fine as well, I guess. Overall, my take on the enhancements would be that Necromechanic is definitely worth including even if it costs loads. The rest are all situational even if they're cheap. If they're just 10 points or something to use up the last few points in an army list, then any of them seem kind of fine on a data smith accompanying Castellans up the board, but likely isn't going to change the world in any sort of reliable way. Overall, I think it's interesting enough to try and make a Skitarian Castellan vehicle style army with a bunch of heavy damage dealers just trying to overwhelm the enemy with raw power. The core rule's okay for Castellans, the stratagems all add a little bit of extra power in their own way or another, and I do quite like Necromechanic. Probably overall power is going to be tied to just how powerful the Castellans and the vehicles are, if they don't have enough raw damage and defence just to be spammed and hopefully dominate the game somewhat, then it's probably going to be a fairly niche detachment. Next up we come to the Stealthy Stalkers of the Skitari Hunter Cohort. This one feels like the sort of Vanguard Infiltrate and Stealth Detachment that seems to be a common staple in lots of codexes so far. And for the Admech feel, it does feel like it could be used to represent Stygis 8. Their stealth optimization was something that was quite a big thing in previous codexes. As with the Cohort Cybernetica, it is really quite a limited detachment. It's not really going to do anything much for any miniatures that aren't Skitari models. And even then, the majority of the benefits are just all focused on infantry and iron striders, as opposed to things like the Scorpius tanks and onagers. At least there are a fair few flavours of Skitari infantry though. It definitely has more options on the table than the Data Sarm Conclave with the Cult Mechanicus units. The primary rule for the detachment is that Skitari infantry, Skitari mounted, and Iron Strider Ballastari all gain the stealth keyword, so that would be a minus one to hit at range, maybe a little bit more impactful against some armies than others, and it won't be doing anything against melee armies. Sicarian units that are greater than 12 inches away can also gain cover as well, which is kind of handy. I suppose might give them a little bit more durability if they are right out in the open and don't get cover already, but a lot of the time it might not make too much difference given that they've got a 4 plus save and a 5 plus invulnerable, they might have often been saving on their invulnerable anyway. I'd say it's certainly not a bad start though, provided you're going heavy on those specific units and you don't mind doing so, it is going to make them die a little bit less fast to enemy guns. For the stratagems, and as mentioned they're all locked to either just Skitari units or certain Skitari subtypes as detailed per stratagem. First up for 2 CP we have Binaric Offence, this one means that two Skitari units get extra AP against one nominated enemy, either in the shooting phase or the fight phase. The downside is that they can't target anything else, so it's not very good if you wanted to split fire, but it does mean that two units' guns get significantly scarier. This is one of the few options that isn't locked to infantry type units, so I guess you could use that on Onagers or Scorpius Disintegrators if you wanted to use it on some hefty firepower. It does seem kind of nice for a few things that have a whole bunch of spammed shots though, maybe things like phosphor torches from the sterilizers. Extra AP will be kind of handy there. I think 2 CP is a bit of a big ask for this one though, you'd have to be hitting something important of the enemy with two really quite big and important units. If it makes a big difference, like the difference between saving on a 3 or saving on a 4 or a 2 and a 3 though, then it could well be worth it if you've got something to shoot that's meaningful enough. 
For one CP, there's Bionic Endurance. This one's a reactive 5 plus feel no pain when you're attacked in the fight phase or the enemy shooting phase with either a Taraxi, Sicarian, or Sidonian units. That one definitely feels like a surprise nice to have to really keep a unit fighting. If you're being attacked by damage 1 weapons, that's a 50% durability increase. It can be a little bit more variable with other stuff though. Though it's certainly really quite nice for damage 2 weapons hitting those 2 wound infantry units. I feel like it perhaps feels mightiest if you applied it to a Sidonian Dragoon unit and got them to have the feel no pain type save. That's going to make them seriously tanky and they are kind of cheap already. If they could make a long charge with their new advance and charge rule, then you could maybe have them in a position where they're actually going to take some serious work on the opponent's part to bring them down when they get inevitably counter-attacks. Quite nice for 1 CP, I think. Next for 1 command point, we've got Expedited Purge Protocol. This one's advance and charge for a Skitari unit, which again is really quite good for threat ranges. I feel like that one's maybe a little bit situational, given which units that you can use it on. Could be fun perhaps for infiltrators venturing deep into the enemy deployment zone turn 1, or Ross Stalkers putting on a turn of speeds to charge something key. As mentioned, the Dragoons with the Taser Lancers already have it, and you can't use it on the Castellans or the Cataphrons, as neither of those are Skitari. For one command point, there's Isolate and Destroy. This one is when you're shooting with either a Sicarian, Taraxi, or Sidonian unit, or Skitari mounted or Iron Striders, so basically most things bar battles line really. In any case, these get a plus one to wound against the enemy if they're not within six inches of another enemy unit. Plus one to wound is definitely nice enough, could be good for one CP. Maybe seems nice on the Iron Striders perhaps if they were shooting at something that's toughness 12, or both flavours of Taraxi seem like they'd like it quite nicely. Might be right in the right situation, though the restriction means that a lot of the time it just won't be an option whatsoever, so it's not going to be as much of a reliable one. For one command point, there's Shroud Protocols. This one is a big one and it means that a Skitari infantry unit can't be shot when they're greater than 12 inches away, and it's declared when the opponent selects targets. This one does seem to be a staple that Games Workshop are handing out to most of the codexes out there, and just about wherever this crops up, it is pretty massive in the right situation. You could have an outlying unit on an objective that guaranteed won't die this turn and live to score you some points. Could be really big at keeping fragile damage dealers alive though. Maybe units without the most exciting defensive profiles could be a bit more interesting if you've got the option to ruin the enemy counter-attack or at least things that can't move to within 12 inch range. I certainly feel like this one will be played a fair bit and it's perhaps most frustrating for your opponent because they don't know where you're going to use it. Finally for one command point there's programmed withdrawal. At the end of the fight phase, two Sicarian units or one Skitari infantry or mounted unit can return to strategic reserve if it's at least three inches away from enemy models. Again, this one really is quite a handy stratagem where it crops up, means that a unit that's out of the fight can just swoop round the edge of the board to jump in and attack something else. I feel like it might be biggest for things like the Taraxi Skystalkers or Sterilizers, which means they could deep strike on turn three and then jump back into the sky or ready to swoop down and torch some new things, or do some secondary objectives. All in all, I'd say that this is a really strong stratagem section. I feel like most of these are really quite usable. The feel no pain's nice, maybe particularly on Dragoons. The advance and charge is good for Sicarians, or just giving you the option if you need to critically get to an objective. Shroud Protocols is amazing, and it's going to be super annoying for keeping the opponent guessing, and Program Withdrawal is nice to jump round the board doing secondaries. Overall, it is limited to a subsection of the codex, but at least there's a fair few options within that one, and I feel like there's a lot here to draw you to the detachments. Finally, there's a few fun tricks from the Hunter Cohort enhancements as well. Again, all of these are locked to Skitari, two specifically to the Marshal, and two that can be taken by the Scatros as well. The Cantic Thralnet can give you a little bit of Doctrina manipulation. One Skitari unit within 12 inches gets both Doctrinas when they're declared. Probably going to be most relevant for putting a single unit in the Protector Doctrina to get plus one to hit. I feel like this formation will almost certainly want to be making use of Conqueror more. Seems like pretty reasonable support for, say, a lone Scorpius tank sat in your own deployment zone. It could potentially both be tougher and more dangerous each turn between both buffs. Next, Clandestine Hunter is Infiltrators and Scouts for the Bearers unit. So I guess that could be a sneaky Scatros that can be a lone operative in the midfield and have a bit of a sneaky reposition just before the first turn happens, or I guess the Marshal will be joining some Vanguard or Rangers. Maybe Vanguard gain a bit more from this given that the Rangers could already scout. I feel like the combo of the two is quite handy, it means that you could use the scout move to stay extra safe if the opponent gets first turn, 
but push up the boards right to the edge of their deployment zone if you do. Maybe do some first turn move blocking type things, or perhaps kill something opportune with a small flurry of special weapon fire. I feel like that is going to be at least a fairly pricey infiltration unit though, at least compared with things like infiltrators which are only 70 points, this one would wind up being far more than that. Next up we've got Veiled Hunter, again this one is only for the Marshal, he gets to redeploy 3 Skitari infantry units after you know who's got first turn, and it can be placed into strategic reserve if that's desired. I feel like this one if it's not too expensive is probably worth having on the table if you are taking a fair few Skitari infantry, which I'm sure in this detachment you're probably going to be. It basically allows perfect knowledge redeployment, definitely allows some really nice options this, if your opponent say had managed to deploy with a crafty line of sight on something, then you could make sure that your unit was newly hidden and leave them with nothing to shoot. Or if you get first turn you could maybe put a unit down in a position where it could advance up into a midfield ruin turn 1, so somewhere that it would have been exposed if you'd got second turn, but could be in a good position with the knowledge that you're going first. The strategic reserve option is pretty usable as well. Finally we've got Battlesphere Oblink. This one can both be taken by the Scatros or the Marshal, and it allows you a move shoot move of 6 inches for the bearer's unit, provided they're not in melee, and they can't do it if they want to charge later in the turn. Again if that's cheap enough that could be fun I guess. You'd be having it on a ranger or vanguard unit if it was the lead unit, so I guess that means that you could have them moving at double time up towards the centre of the board and objectives, and maybe allowing some shenanigans, bursting out of cover, shooting and then hiding again with the secondary move. For squads I guess you might already have access to that with the Taraxi Skystalkers if you want it. And I guess it's kind of interesting on this Qatari Scatros as well, that would give you a lone operative that could allow you to basically move 14 inches plus d6 each turn with an advance move. That would be a pretty serious burst of speed to zip around the board and do secondaries where you need it on a model that the opponent needs to close with to destroy. Overall I think they've done well with the enhancements as well here, there's four really quite interesting ones once more. Obviously relative power is going to depend on the points cost for each one, I think any of them are pretty solid if they're cheap. Maybe the 3 unit redeploy might be one of the nicest ones though, that does look like it's got some very good value, and could also be pretty awesome value on infiltrators depending on what FAQ you're using for it, forward deploy plus redeploys can be quite big. Overall I'd certainly say that this looks like one of the stronger detachments in the codex at first glance, maybe the main issue is that with similar detachments like this elsewhere, it does really focus a bit on units that aren't quite your primary damage dealers, more on the lighter infantry with things that kill enemy infantry as opposed to big tanks with heavy guns or cataphron servitors. Still though I think there's just so many nice tricks that could give you some serious advantages here that I'm sure that this will see some play. Next up we've got the Tet Priest and the Electro Priests and a whole load of War Hymns as the Data Psalm Conclave is basically the detachment for the Court Mechanicus formations and in the book the things that have been given that keyword are the Tech Priests the Cataphron Servitors and both flavours of Electro Priests, it is quite a small list, and the Castell and Robots didn't get that, they got Legio Cybernetica instead. The detachment is going to be very heavily focused on those units and doesn't really provide many buffs for anything else, but given that list includes the mighty Cataphron Breachers, then anything that makes them extra good is probably going to be strong competitively, at least unless Games Workshop up their points or something. In any case, the core rule for the Data Psalm Conclave is basically a choice between two different buffing rules at the start of the game. It's called Benedictions of the Omnisire, and you basically get to choose between Panegyric Procession or Citation in Savagery. Depending on whether or not you want your Cult Mechanicus units to have extra power at close range shooting or in melee. For the close range shooting, Panegyric Procession gives you an extra pip of AP if you shoot with a Cult Mechanicus unit within half range of the enemy. That could be nice for Cataphron Breachers with the AP on the Heavy Arc Rifles that want to be within half range anyway for the Rapid Fire. Though it could be pretty strong getting Corpus Carvey Electro Priests a bit of AP, or maybe Cataphron Destroyers with Graph Cannons perhaps. On the other hand, Citation in Savagery gives you plus 1 strength and plus 1 attack on the charge, and that one's locked to Court Mechanicus Keyword Units, so I think technically you might be able to get Skitari Rangers or Vanguard to benefit from that if you leave them with a Tech Priest though it's sort of a bit meaningless as that wouldn't really be particularly good even if you can. That really does take the melee units to the next level a bit, perhaps a bit less relevant on the Corpus Cari Priest, though it's certainly not bad, but really quite threatening on things like Fulgurites being strength 7 and 3 attacks rather than strength 6 and 2, and it's pretty nasty for the Cataphron Servitors as well, with the small but very high quality attacks with the Hydraulic Claws. 
Overall, I feel like both of those choices do seem quite fun on first take. Maybe the extra AP on breaches might be the slightly more boring but useful choice, though I guess you could flex it a bit depending on the game, maybe. I guess if you were, say, playing against Chaos Demons who have invulnerable saves anywhere, the extra AP isn't really going to be very relevant, so you may as well just go for Cetacean and Savagery there. Otherwise, again, like the Hunter Cohort, these ones are all stratagem locks and can only be used on Court Mechanicus units, and the keywords here specify that they only affect Court Mechanicus models as well. So unless I missed anything, I don't think that these can be used on the Rangers or Vanguard. For 1 CP, we've got Incantation of the Iron Soul, this one's a 4 plus save against mortal wounds and he can trigger it in any phase. Handy enough durability boost, though it's not really super common now that devastating wounds are no longer mortal wounds. Bar some slightly niche specific damage dealers, I feel like that one's going to be a bit redundant for the most part, unless Games Workshop changes around the core rules to do something different with devastating wounds again. For one command point, there's the Chant of the Remorseless Fist. This one's a nice simple plus one to the wound roll in any fight phase. Hard to go too far wrong with this one, and I think between this one and the Cetacean in Savagery, you could have the Court Mechanicus units being genuinely quite scary melee threats on the charge. Cash from Breaches would look really quite nasty with three attacks at Strength 9 and Damage 3, and a plus one to wound on the go. For 1 CP, there's Verse and Vengeance, a 4 plus for models in the units to fight on death. Again, that's alright on both flavours of Electro Priests and the Breaches. I guess maybe that one feels like it could be a bit more relevant to Electro Priests, given that they really are quite easy to kill for their points cost. Being able to go down fighting could be quite a big deal there. For one command point, there's Tribute of Emphatic Veneration. This one triggers at the start of your movement phase, and you pick one enemy unit within 18 inches of a Court Mechanicus unit. That enemy unit has to test Battleshock, and takes a minus one to hit penalty until your next command phase, if they fail. Really not too sure what they were thinking with this one really. A minus one to hit would only be kind of okay if it didn't have to test Battleshock, and as a result, you could often just be using this stratagem and then basically have it do nothing the majority of the time, let alone provide an okay debuff. For one command point, there's a fun one called Litany of the Electromancer. In your shooting phase, you get to roll 1d6 per enemy unit within 6 inches of your unit, and on a 5+, plus, those enemy units take d3 mortal wounds. He gets to add plus one to the result if there was an Electro Priest being used for this, so they're quite good at handling out the electric damage. I feel like realistically you probably have to have quite a lot of enemy units to be in range of this for it to be worth it on an outright damage front. Even if you have three units for a regular unit of yours, then that's still usually only going to average you d3 mortal wounds, which isn't very much. I guess it might be biggest if you were able to just finish off an enemy threat that all of your shooting hadn't quite managed to kill, that could be perhaps one of the best uses. Even then though it would have to be something that you couldn't just have easily charged and killed, which quite a lot of the Court Mechanicus units will be capable of doing. Kind of fun, it might have the right situation crop up in the Electro Priest being aggressive out of Dune Riders perhaps. Finally for one command point we've got Luminescent Blessing. This one's a 4 plus invulnerable save for a Court Mechanicus unit against enemy shooting, and this one kind of feels like the Imperial Knights rotate Ion Shields type power, often going to be increasing the save from a 5 plus to a 4 plus on the invulnerable side, though I guess it's a little bit better for the Cataphrons. I guess it could theoretically be handy on any Court Mechanicus things, though it does feel like it's best for the Cataphron Servitors, as they're most likely to be taking high strength, high AP firepower, but it's exactly the sort of thing that you'd want to shrug off with an invul. Overall, the stratagems are a bit of a mixed bag, and as mentioned, they are really quite restricted to the units that you can use them on. Out of these, my favourites are probably the plus one to wound from the Chant of the Remorseless Fist, and the four plus invulnerable save one. It perhaps is a bit of a shame to have a couple that just seem to stand out bad or ridiculously niche, like the four plus mortal wound save one, or the battle shock for the minus one to hit. Finally, for the Data Psalm Conclave, we have the Enhancements. Mechanicus Locum is one that gives you a little bit of leadership defense. It gives your tech priest a leadership 6 plus if you didn't already have one. That's relevant for the more junior ones. And once per game, you get to cancel Battleshock for a Court Mechanicus unit within 12 inches at the start of any phase. I feel like that one maybe sounds better than it is. Seeing as it has to be the start of any phase, it means that you can't just immediately cancel Battleshock on failing it in your command phase, which means that you wouldn't get to immediately score primaries that you otherwise would be missing out on. Overall seems a little bit niche, though maybe not unhelpful to have if it's ridiculously cheap. Next up we have the slightly weirdly named Mantle of Nosty Arch. This one makes a tech priest a bit more durable, where all attacks become damage 1 against them, rather than multi-damage so they'll take lots of focus fire to bring down. 
Seems okay as a durability relic. I guess that'd mean that they'd be less likely to get sniped out of a unit if that was a fear. Again, not all for if it's super cheap, and perhaps particularly for a more adventurous or aggressive unit going towards the enemy. If the Tear Priest was allowed to annoyingly survive with this, I guess it could be alright. Perhaps one of the most interesting is the Data Blessed Auto Sermon. This one allows a Tech Priest unit to use the other benediction of the Omnissiah once per game for their lead unit. So if you went for the combat one, that'd be extra AP on guns. If you went for the ranged one, then that would be the plus one attack and plus one strength. That one's kind of weird and kind of involved. It might mean that you have a character that you want on a very different unit from one game to the next. Though I guess on something that's just general purpose threatening like those Cataphron Breachers, this could genuinely just be handy to have for either case. Finally, the last and the fairly scary one is the Tempocopia. This one allows the Tech Priest units to fight first. So I'd say that this one is probably one that you'd want either on the Cataphron Breachers or on the Fulgurite Electro Priests. For the Breachers, it's just going to make them a lot more intimidating to charge with a big scary heavy hitting unit. They'll be taking a bunch of Hydraulic Claw attacks first. Or for the Fulgurite Priests, they definitely feel like a unit that's in danger of just getting wiped out by the enemy charge before they get to fight back. So fights first is exactly what they want. Points depending, I feel like the last two are by far the most interesting. The fights first is great and the auto sermon could give you some solid extra flexibility. Overall feels like an interesting one to weigh up. It does feel perhaps a little bit painful having all the buffs of the army just layered onto four units and pretty much nothing else. Everything else only really has the strength of its datasheet to fall back on. But as mentioned, if Cataphron Breachers basically remain one of the strongest damage dealer units, that might not be the worst thing for raw power in the world, even if it's not the most interesting. And perhaps enough of these buffs could get together so that some Fulgurites or Corpus Gari and Dune Riders might actually be pretty worth it. Finally, last but by no means least, we have the Rad Zone Core. Their main rule is Rad Bombardment, and this one was really quite heavily updated from the Index version, which by all accounts was kind of bad. I did quite like the idea of it, basically the Admech just softening up the enemy with some horrific radiation shells and then fallout precipitating from there but it kind of amounted to some sort of useless first turn battle shock backed up by some tiny chip damage, and I feel like at least this will get a bit better on both fronts now. The rule affects any units that are within their deployment zone, so that would include anything that's partially within it, not just fully within it. It's stronger on the first turn, but then does a bit more for the rest of the game. On turn 1, where usually most of the opponent's army is going to be in their deployment zone, they have to choose between taking cover or standing firm with each individual unit. If they choose to take cover, the unit is battle shocked, and that lasts until the end of the first battle round, so will prevent stratagems for those units, though it's not usually relevant for scoring primary objectives. The upgrade with the new rule, though, is that they still have the chance to take damage when previously they didn't. On a 5+, plus, they take D3 mortal wounds, so that should hand out at least some damage to quite a lot of units out of the enemy army, provided they've got lots of ones for you to roll at. On the other hand, if they're a unit that absolutely needs to use a stratagem, or perhaps threaten to score secondaries, or needs to remain not battle shocked for other reasons, like say Astra Militarum orders, then instead they can choose to stand firm, and instead they take those D3 mortal wounds on a 3+, plus, not on a 5. I feel like for most armies, most of the time, they're usually still going to want to accept the battle shock and have less chance of damage, as it's just not going to matter too much for the majority of units in the game. But still say, even if you had the entire enemy army choose to do that, then if they had say 12 units in their deployment zone, that'd be 8 mortal wounds scattered over the army. Not too bad as a little bit of a softener up type rule, perhaps particularly so for anything that's got really quite a lot of points per wound. Then from battle round 2 plus, there's a further improvement as well. You still have the 3 plus chance to take the fallout damage of 1 mortal wound, but now if you do take fallout damage for being partially within your deployment zone, then you also must test Battle Shock as well, though this Battle Shock test isn't quite as impactful, arguably, as you test in the Admech player's command phase now. So I guess it's not going to stop the opponent from scoring their own objectives, but I guess in theory there might be a chance for it to stop them contesting their home objective if the Admech player had a chance to score it. In any case, it's a chance to prevent a few defensive or reactive stratagems in the enemy turn, which occasionally I think will be disruptive. Overall, it's definitely considerably better, though it was starting from a very, very weak point indeed. I feel like it's now something that actually does add strength to the army, where it didn't really very much before, and it can be boosted by one of the enhancements to get these effects out to within 6 inches of the opponent's deployment zone as well, so that's quite a lot harder to avoid just by towing out with a few units.
Otherwise, for the stratagems, there have been a few changes here as well. For 2CP, Baleful Halo, I believe has the same name, but new rules. This one was previously a minus one to wound in the fight phase for an enemy unit attacking yours, so quite a big deal with debuffing enemy attacks. Now though, it costs 2 CP rather than 1, which just makes it so much lower value, although you do have the option that if you choose a battle line unit, you get to select another non-battle line Skitari unit within 6 inches. Quite a few of them have that rider, though I feel like in the fight phase that's really going to be all that relevant. I think that this was far stronger when it was just 1 CP for 1 unit, rather than 2 CP for 1 and maybe another one if it helps. For 1 command point, there's Extinction Order. This one is one that deals some Mortal Wounds Battleshock tests on an objective marker. A Tet Priest deploys it within 24 inches, and for a 4 plus for each unit that's on that objective marker, they have to take 1 Mortal Wound and a Battleshock test. I don't feel like that one's very strong to be honest. I guess the biggest impact could be if it stops an enemy unit from scoring an objective, but it's already a coin flip as to whether the enemy even needs to take the Battleshock test, never mind if they actually score it. Next up for one command point, there's Lethal Dose. This one's Lethal Hits for one Abmech unit. A nice, simple and effective damage boost that one. I feel like that one's handy enough to have. Usually this one's a good one to go for if you had a unit that was wounding on a 5 plus against an enemy unit. That adds up to a 50% damage boost there. Though it's still a plus 25% on a 4 plus. Seems kind of nice for any sort of mid strength shooting. Maybe catch from breaches. But it could be quite nice on any of these spammed shots, Guitari type units. Maybe a big unit of Sky Stalkers or Infiltrators. This one basically replaced the 2 command point plus 1 to wound an enemy unit when you're shooting stratagem. For 1 CP, there's Aggressor Imperative. This one's an auto advance 6 inches for a Skitari unit. And again, it's got the rule that if you choose a battle line unit, then you can choose another Skitari unit within 6 inches to also benefit. Auto advance is handy to have access to, means that you could potentially move a unit up to get to a central objective super reliably. And in the Conqueror Imperative, you'll still be able to shoot. Situationally great if it means that you get line of sight on range or something that you otherwise couldn't. This one replaced the Advance and Charge stratagem, which went to the Skitari Hunter cohort. Next up, for one command point, there's Pre-Calibrated Purge Solution. This one extra punishes enemy units that stay in their own deployment zone, as he gets two reroll hit rolls for a unit shooting at an enemy unit, provided they're partially within their deployment. Again, it has the thing where you can double up on a battle line Skitari unit and another non-battle line one within 6 inches. Reroll all hits is quite a big deal. And you could combine this one with the lethal dose one potentially to get a whole bunch of auto wounds. Kind of dependent on the opponent keeping something important within their deployment zone though. But I suppose it could be nice enough for units trying to hunt down enemy units on their home objective. Could be quite nice for Catafron destroyers as well. That will be rather fun on their plasma weapons perhaps. This one replaced the return fire stratagem that they had access to which is kind of a shame. That one was a rather good one. Finally, we have the Bulwark Imperative. This one's a reactive 4 plus and vulnerable save for Skitari units only. Again, you can get it on two Skitari units if you use it on a battle line one, but just having access to a pop up 4 plus and vulnerable is rather handy. I think it is just a shame that it costs 2 CP rather than 1, though. I feel like it's a lot more questionable at that sort of price, although at least you don't have to be in the Protector Doctrina to use it anymore. Overall, a bit of a mixed bag on the stratagems. I feel like it at least incentivizes you to have some of the Skitari battle line in your army. You might be able to double up on stratagem value from time to time. Out of these, for raw value, I think I prefer the 1 command point ones more. Lethal Dose and Pre-Calibrated Purge are both nice damage ones, and Aggressor Imperative for Auto Advance is going to be handy from time to time. Kind of a shame about the Return Fire one going away though. That was a rather nice stratagem and could make shooting certain units really quite a risky move for your opponent's point of view. Finally we get to the enhancements where the first one is Radial Suffusion. This is the one that allows you to extend the Rad Zone Cohort's primary rule to the midfield and it takes effect from Battle Round 2 onwards. Seems like a reasonable enough one to pick up, probably adding up to a few mortal wounds and some battle shock tests over the course of the game. Far harder to avoid compared with it just being the enemy DZ. If it's super expensive though, it might well not be worth it, and you would want to have it on a model that's quite likely to survive somewhere safe for most of the game, as you don't just want them getting killed and the effect going away. This one looks like it replaced the one for manipulating the Doctrinas for Skitari units, so you can't flip things from Protector to Conqueror in this detachment anymore. 
Next up, we have Malphonic Cerceros, which was previously 25 points. This one is just a renamed version of Excoriating Emanation. It gives stealth to the bearer's unit, really quite nice on durable Cataphron blocks. Could be interesting enough on Castell and robots moving up, I suppose. Probably something that's tough is the one to go for for this. Next up, Peerless Eradicator is the renamed version of Master Annihilator. A nice simple sustained hits one for your ranged attacks. Extra damage output for your unit. Again, very good for Cataphrons of both varieties. Kind of hard to go too far wrong with this one. Finally, and perhaps one of the sadder changes of the detachment is the Omni Sterilizer has been replaced by the far less cool named Autoclavic Denunciation. This one simply gives your bearer's weapons the anti-infantry 2 plus and anti-monster 4 plus to their ranged weapons, so it's usually relevant for things with the devastating wounds like the Tech Priest Dominus's Volkite, or perhaps more commonly the Manipulus's Transonic Cannon. Hopefully this one might have gone down in price as a result, but it now no longer gives you the extra plus 3 attacks to those ranged weapons as well, which did get you kicking out really quite a lot of firepower, and potentially wiping out entire squads of elite infantry with a single burst of firepower. If it's cheap, I think it still will be absolutely usable on the Dominus or the Manipulus, though I feel like it's probably not going to be an auto-include anymore. I feel like this one probably won't go down well as a change, though maybe it isn't the worst idea not to have a relic just so ridiculously auto-include that you'd be kind of mad not to take it. Might be a bit better for internal codex balance, obviously provided Games Workshop can keep Admeg as an army strong. Overall, it's perhaps a bit of a mixed bag with the Rad Zone cohort, I think. The detachment rule is certainly a little bit stronger. That is going to add up to more mortal wounds at the start of the game, whichever way you play it. The stratagem section does seem overall weaker though, particularly losing that return firepower, but having a couple of stratagems bump up to 2 CP with the weird Skitari targeting thing maybe isn't the most helpful. The Omni Sterilizer getting worse isn't the most helpful, but at least the stealth and the sustained hits one both remain. They're still going to be very good for big chunky units of damage dealers. Overall though, I still think it looks solid enough as an all-round Admech detachment, Aside from some boosted versions of the stratagems, most things aren't really locked to too many keywords. It still feels like a detachment that's probably going to be quite strong for multiple big units of Cataphrons out there. Enhancements that are really quite strong for them, plus some big damage dealer stratagems that might help them out more than just about anything else. Overall, I feel like Games Workshop haven't done too badly, at least from a game design point of view perhaps, to make some interesting detachments from the Admech. I feel like perhaps a lot of players' real lists might not genuinely fit into a bunch of these super well straight away. The Rad Zone core, I still say, looks fine. It's nice having a usable detachment rule, but it did get two of its best supporting rules nerfed. The Exploratory Manipal, I think, has an okay supporting rule and good enhancements, though the stratagems, for the most part, I feel like are at least somewhat weak. Otherwise, the other three are just really quite datasheet dependent, unless you have enough to make up a chunky size of your force in either Skitari, Infantry and Iron Striders, Castell and Robots and Vehicles, or Court Mechanicus units respectively, they might not be all that appealing straight away. That might be a bit more of a criticism of the current detachment system and things being quite locked to keywords though, more than just specifically these Admech ones. Out of those other three, the Skitari Hunter Cohort I think has some of the very best supporting rules, really quite powerful stuff, but only applies to things that don't generally tend to be as strong damage dealers that can take down the toughest stuff in your opponent's army perhaps. Loads of cool tricks though, and I feel like that one will see play. The Cohort Cybernetica is maybe banking on things like Castellans and Vehicles having enough raw strength to be a bit of an Admech beatdown army. Definitely feels like a very easy way to play, just try and line up loads of big guns and shoot or stomp the enemy off the board. The stratagems are maybe a little bit on the predictable side though, even if they do add some raw damage. And the data Sam Conclave perhaps seems usable enough if you want to spam breaches specifically, and they do turn out to be one of the best units still. Maybe Electro Priest having the best chance to get a look in here compared with the rest. At first glance it feels like the internal balance of these isn't too horrible, and I wouldn't be too surprised if they all do at least somewhat well in optimised lists. Maybe the Hunter Cohort one looks a little bit more standard out of the rest for me, though I'll be interested to hear your guys' takes. That's detachments done, but let's move on to data sheets, where quite a few Admech units have certainly seen some improvements, though there have been some nerfs or side grades. As with the Index, the battle line units in the Codex are the Skitari Vengers and Vanguard. That means that you can take up to 6 units of each of those, though I think it would be kind of a rare list that really makes you want to take that many of them. They do seem to be at least partly carried by the fact that they buff the other units around them, 
giving them things like, say, the cash from breaches their re-rolls to hit, but there's quite a lot of other variants for other data sheets out there. The Catafron servitors aren't battle line despite having been troops in the past, and otherwise just for a few common themes of the codex, most things generally tend to hit on a 4+, plus, which maybe isn't enormously great for dealing with modifiers. Invulnerable saves tend to be fairly common for the army, often a 5+, plus from bionics on much of their infantry besides their tanks and flyers, and most of the faction are leadership 7+, plus. it does mean that they're a little bit easier to battleshock compared with certain space marines and friends. Codex Adeptus Mechanicus has 30 data sheets, and as mentioned at the start of the video, there is one new one in that Sidonian Scatros. The chicken walkers of the Sidonian Dragoons have been split up into two different units, one armed with the Taser Lance and one with the Radium Jezail to allow them different points, costs, and different special rules, which I think is a sensible enough move really. I feel like that allows them both to be a bit more balanced, though perhaps the same could have been achieved just by literally allowing war gear to cost points, which Set Games Workshop does seem to be allergic to in 10th edition. Otherwise, the only data sheet that was removed was the standard Servitor Squad. They're the little unit of four guys where you could have two of them with multi-melters or another heavy weapon, and they were just generally seen as a low investment unit to do absolute minimum investment grunt work. In reality, I feel like you'd almost always be worth upgrading them for a small amount of cost to one of the many skirmisher type units that Admech have. Say for example, you could get Cerberus Raiders for just 10 extra points, at least pre-codex, and if you wanted Chaff Infantry, you're probably better off with the Agents of the Imperium Inquisitorial Henchmen anyway. In any case, they are no more. Otherwise, for datasheet changes, a few keywords were handed out. The Cult Mechanicus keyword was handed out to Tech Priests, Catafron Servitors, and Electro Priests. That's only really relevant for the Datasarm Conclave. It doesn't really have any impact beyond that. The Legio Cybernetica keyword was added to Castellans and the Datasmiths. That one's just relevant for the Cybernetica cohort. Would be kind of cool if they expanded the options for that by releasing more Automata in the future. You could definitely have some more 40k versions of some other 30k ones. And the smoke keyword was gained by a few vehicles, sometimes as just a new addition to the datasheet in the case of the Scorpius Dune Rider. But for the Onager it was just kind of set as the default option pretty much, when you still have the choice of swapping it out for the data tether. Just picking out a few key bits from the datasheets, here are a few of the slightly more impactful datasheet changes in my opinion. Then we'll go through the datasheets one by one after this, and talk through them in a little bit more depth. Overall I feel like perhaps Dune Riders got a bit better, their stubbers all got twin linked so they're considerably more threatening to enemy light infantry now, and they trade their special rule for advance and disembark for allowing the unit that just disembarks to reroll wound rolls with their shooting if they target the same thing as the Dune Rider does. They also gained the smoke keyword. The Castellan robots seem just massively improved. The regular Phosphor Blasters get AP 1 but went down to damage 1, whereas the heavy Phosphor Blaster got damage 2 up from damage 1. Overall, I'd say that's an improvement. And the Datasmiths got buffed on multiple levels. They get to start the game in Aegis, no longer need to roll leadership against changing the protocol, and no longer give the infantry keyword to them. Going from being genuinely passable for the unit, I thought, to being pretty much auto include even if you only have two. Otherwise, the Stratoraptor is damaged too with its Phosphor Blasters, which is quite a big boost. The Sidonian Dragoons with the Taser Lances get to advance and charge, which is nice. The Onager gets a fun Force Field type rule, giving the Battle Line units a 4 plus invulnerable save next to it. Belisarius Call swaps his Shroud Psalm from stealth to just the benefit of cover, which occasionally might be better, but often might be worse. And the Tech Priest Engines here is better at making your vehicles tougher, I think, swapping the invulnerable save that he granted to a 5 plus feel no pain, which I think for most units will be the superior option. As I mentioned in a previous video on the channel, I'm still a little bit concerned about the maybe lack of threat that a lot of the more infantry units and squads tend to have though. I feel like it might have been a clever move on Games Workshop's part to make the individual Skitari models, say like the troops or the infiltrators, Rust Stalkers, Cerberus and Taraxi, just a bit more threatening or a bit tougher on the board. At the moment, they have to charge them for fairly depressingly cheap points cost on the board, despite how expensive they are to buy in real world terms, and it does make Admeg a fantastically expensive army to collect, arguably even more so than in the past. Perhaps feels like a bit of a missed opportunity just to give these units a bit more bulk in terms of damage and defence, and allow them to cost a bit more points as a result, so the typical Admech army that you might buy doesn't cost you quite as much in the wallet when you're buying them from Games Workshop. I feel like that's really something that puts people off getting into the faction. 
In any case though, let's jump into the data sheets proper and we'll start out with the new one in the Sidonian Scatros and then we'll move through the rest, starting with squads, then moving to vehicles, then characters. The Sidonian Scatros is rumoured to have a points cost of around 65 points, though Games Workshop could change that in their field manual update at the moment. As mentioned, we won't have the final points cost confirmed until they release their download, which I will cover here on the channel. The Scatros gets an 8 inch move, toughness 4 with a 4 plus save and a 5 plus invulnerable, and gets stealth and bone operative to protect him against enemy shooting. Besides the ones that need to be near other units to gain loan operative, the Scatros is the only native loan operative that the Abmech have access to, though I guess he might be competing against the Imperial Assassins, perhaps particularly the Vindicare being a sniper. Otherwise, he's an infantry character with the Skitari and Sidonian keyword. For weapons, the big tall stilt man gets to attack with his Sidonian feet in melee, so he attacks at strength 3. I do quite like the idea of kicking the enemy to death, but besides that he gets a Mechanicus pistol. That allows him to do a bit of chip damage if he happens to be in melee, and then of course the main event is that sniper rifle, which you can either choose a Radium Jezail or a Scatros Transuranic Arquebus. They both are a single sniper shot with a range of 36 inches, the Jezail is strength 5, AP 2 and damage 3 with heavy precision and an anti-infantry 3 plus keyword that he gets to re-roll wounds with his special rule. The Arquebus is strength 7, AP 2 but damage D3. Instead of getting anti-infantry it gets both anti-vehicle and anti-monster 4 plus and similarly that one can re-roll wound rolls against monsters and vehicles. Unfortunately there's just no real getting around that damage output wise this guy just isn't very good at all. I'd be more tempted to go for the Radium Jezail as that actually could be at least somewhat scary to enemy characters, whereas the Arquebus with only damage D3 is just sort of underwhelming against everything, monsters and vehicles included, for 65 points. I guess if he did wind up being super cheap then it could be a lot more interesting. I feel like either way though his main value is just going to be an annoying lone operative more than anything else, which can be handy for standing on objectives and guaranteeing that he can't be shot, or turning up to do secondary objectives, and then again just being disruptive and meaning that the opponent has to get close to him if they want to actually deal damage. Otherwise his second special rule as Dread Sniper means that one unit hit must take a Battleshock test, which isn't that great with the current version of Battleshock rules in 10th edition, unless Games Workshop choose to change things around, and he also isn't allowed to be the Warlord, but that doesn't stop him from taking enhancements, say the couple that he can have access to in the Skitari Hunter cohort. Obviously going to be a bit points dependent, I feel like he would genuinely have to be very very cheap if he was going to get a lot of play really. I'd say probably 50 points or below to actually look good, and even then he might be a bit more tempting for his lone operative ability rather than his actual damage output so much. I just can't help but think that if he was 65 points then you'd probably just be better off upgrading to the Vindicare for the extra 15. A similar sort of lone operative offering but does get the access to a better sniper rifle. Moving on to the updated data sheets, and first up we have the battle line. The Skitari Rangers are largely unchanged. Both they and the Vanguard get more objective control than most at OC2, and perhaps are most often tempting to include as they trigger special rules on a lot of other units' data sheets, making them a bit better in one way or the other, particularly Catastron Breachers. In general, though, it looks like the Rangers' data sheet is pretty much unchanged. They just rolled in the 4 plus save and the 5 plus invulnerable save that the balanced data slate gave them before. So at least this Qatari battle line is looking a bit more durable than it was at 10th launch. Otherwise the squad strikes with galvanic rifles, two shots with strength 4 AP 0 to 30 inch range. It can take one of each of the special weapons, so some sort of general purpose fire with the arc rifle, plasma caliber and the arquebus. They get to scout 6 inches which they could confer to a dune rider if they wanted. They can ignore cover or get the enhanced data tether for some slightly more efficient stratagems and they have the objective scouted special rule which means that it's basically the sticky objective type special rule. If they control a point in your command phase then that point remains yours until the enemy actually manages to claim it. Not the worst to have active on your home deployment objective, you could potentially start the game on that and then move towards the midfield to try and get another. Overall while they remain a 10 model squad I feel like they're probably going to remain a choice to empower other units rather than a strong damage dealer in their own right like they were in 9th edition. Perhaps a unit that you still want in the army, but maybe only want so many of. Their partners in crime are the radiation infused vanguard, which get much of the same options special weapon wise. They were 80 points pre-codex where the rangers were 90, and these get to swap those galvanic rifles for the radium carbines to 
3 attacks at strength 3, AP 0 and damage 1 with anti-infantry 4 plus. They are a bit cheaper but they don't get scouts and they trade out the objective secured type special rule to the rad saturation that one subtracts one from objective control of characteristics in enemy models within 3 inches provided they can actually survive to contest an objective that can be quite big. At only toughness 3 though and volume fire weapons being quite good against them that maybe is the question. I'm sure they'll still see play though, they do just feel like a very central unit to the army buffing lots of other things and they could be interesting enough jumping out of dune riders which did get better. Next up and pretty much carrying the codex since 10th edition launch are the Cataphron Breachers, they've just been one of the best data sheets to put stacking boosts on, perhaps one of the single best choices in the index and codex for character boosts, enhancements or targeted stratagems if you can use them on them. Previously just under 150 points for 3, these guys are toughness 7 with 3 wounds, a 3 plus save and a 6 plus invulnerable, and most typically tended to be fielded with the heavy arc rifles, 2 shots each at strength 8, AP 2 and damage 3, anti-vehicle 4 plus and a rapid fire 2, so really quite a big blistering salvo within 15 inches now. They tend to pair that with the hydraulic claw, 2 attacks at strength 8, AP 2 and damage 3 in combat, again that's going to threaten just about everything in the game. The change that these guys got were that their heavy weapons were reduced in range a bit, the heavy arc rifle down to 30 inches and the torsion cannon to 36. That's definitely going to limit their options a little bit with firepower, particularly with trying to get them into rapid fire range, but they still retained that very nice damage dealing rule where battle line units give them 4 rerolls to hit if they're within 6 inches, so that will keep them with a pretty scary amount of firepower overall. Overall, any radical points changes aside, they're perhaps still looking like one of the units to beat in terms of power units for the Codex. They'll still be interesting in Rad Zone Cohort with the leader buffs that you can get for them there, and the Data Storm Conclave and the enhancements from the Explorator Maniple both could be interesting too. Their alternative build are the Cataphron Destroyers with the Gravel Plasma Cannons. Compared with the Breachers, they're a little bit less tough at toughness 6 rather than 7, though they did cost quite a bit less pre-codex, 115 points per 3, not 145. I think their guns do have perhaps a similar sort of level of threat, but they don't get the big reroll rule that the Breachers do with the Skitari nearby, so don't tend to be quite as vicious with them. The Plasma Culverins can give you 4 shots at strength 8 and damage 2, or the Grav Cannons can give you 4 shots at strength 6, AP 1 and damage 2, with the anti-vehicle keyword. Otherwise they have a backup gun in either a Cognis Flamer or a Phosphor Blaster and their special rule is a 5 plus Overwatch which could be fairly vicious, could be quite nice in combination with Flamers I suppose. Will be interesting to see whether they or Breachers shake out as still the better unit, I guess Breachers have the melee threats where these guys don't. A few of the detachments look like they could be interesting for them as well, extra AP options could be quite nice on the Grav Cannon specifically and lethal hit seems rather nice with the rad cohort on the plasma if it's trying to take down some tanks. Like the destroyers, the only main change was for them to gain the court mechanicus keyword. Next up, let's take a look at the elite Skitari, and first up we have the Sicarian Infiltrators. These are the forward deploy infiltrate units, and they get toughness for a 4 plus save, and 2 wounds with a 5 plus invulnerable. Sort of middling durability when accounting for them having stealth as well, at least pre-codex for the cost. Otherwise these guys are generally good at killing enemy infantry, they get the option of flechette blasters for 5 shots at strength 3 at close range, so potentially 25 shots for a unit of 5 of these, then backing that up with either some power weapon or taser goad attacks in combat. Their special rules unchanged, debuffing enemy leadership and battle shock things up close, but they also gained an extra debuff as well, with voices in the code handing out a battle shock to enemy units at the start of the fight phase as well. Could be interesting with a stacked version of the rules and actually give you a credible chance of preventing enemies using stratagems, which I suppose isn't the worst thing in the world. Overall still probably going to be most relevant for just a cheapish unit to forward deploy and be some threat on midfield objectives, and if the enemy moves light stuff up to try and take them then these guys should hopefully comfortably shred them. They could get quite a lot of support from the hunter cohort, and the flechette carbines with all the shots could be quite nice with lethal hits in rad zone. Their alternative build are the Sicarian Rust Stalkers, the ones that are armed with the Transonic Razors or Cord Claws. They have the same profile, keeping the same 8 inch move, and they also gain stealth, but they can't infiltrate forward deploy. Generally in the codex they haven't been changed, they get a flurry of attacks all at strength 4, 
either with your choice of devastating wounds and four attacks on the models, or anti-infantry three plus and AP minus two, and the princeps gets a slightly better combination of both. Their special rule is plus one to advance and charge, or plus two to both if they're next to battle line units, so they can put on a pretty big turn of speed across the board. With the advance and charge stratagem in the hunter cohort, that could get them moving across the battlefield seriously quite quickly. I think threatening an average 22 inch charge or so if they can coordinate with battle line units nearby, though I guess they might potentially outpace them. I still feel like they probably have to be cheap to attract all that much attention. The main problem is that strength 4 kind of struggles against anything that's toughness 5 or higher, never mind things like heavy vehicles and things where they're wounding on a 6. Good skirmishing, but maybe won't hold up if they run into anything that's got a serious amount of muscle. Next up we have the Curious Wings Taraxi. First up the Skystalkers are the ones with the flechette guns. Again they have the similar sort of profile to the Sicarian units, but get a 12 inch move, fly and deep strike instead. The Skystalkers can throw out a whole load of flechette blaster fire, so they could be getting quite a lot of lethal hits like that with the stratagem in Rad Zone cohort, but they're just sort of good at clearing lighter enemy objective holders like cultists and things anyway, and their special rule is a move shoot move ability. If they're not in an engagement range, then you can potentially have them move either 6 inches or 12 units after they've deep struck. 12 inches if there's a battle line unit nearby, and it can be interesting in combination with deep strike as it means that they could move the unit quite deep into the enemy lines, though they wouldn't be able to charge of course. At 65 points, I thought they competed okay for a utility unit, cheap units to drop in and do secondaries and then make a big nuisance of themselves since then with some big movement shenanigans. With their guns being locked to strength 3 and AP 0 though, they're not going to do anything to anything with either high toughness or high armour. The sterilizers are the version of those with the phosphor torches, swapping out the flechette guns with some auto hitting essentially flamers, the sergeant getting a taser goad instead. Again there are cheap units that can jump down to do secondaries and also threaten a little bit of overwatch, and their special rule was changed quite a bit. Previously their searing conflagration gave you a movement debuff, so a minus 2 to move advance and charge on a 4+. plus. That's been swapped to a damage boost of rerolling ones to wound against enemy units on objectives, going up to 4 rerolls to wound if they're next to a battle line unit when they're targeting such a unit. I guess that's not unhelpful really, maybe not quite as much disruption as the movement debuff thing. I feel like it's kind of sad that the second part is ties to a battle line unit nearby though. There are at least a fair few units out there that get some big damage buffs like that that are target units on objectives and they don't have to have any sort of Skitari type troops supporting them. I guess they did get a bit better at purging enemies off points though, which maybe isn't too bad if you want to threaten light units in the backfield. Next up, in the Abmeg Infantry Killing Disruption units we have the Cerberus Raiders. These were 60 points per 3 of them before. And again, they've got pretty much the same profile as the others. Compared with the Taraxe, they swap the fly keyword for the mounted keyword, so are going to be a bit harder to move around terrain. The Cerberus Raiders are quite a nice movement unit. They get to scout 9 inches, so they could go up the board very, very quickly. They could potentially threaten turn 1 move block things if they really wanted to. Their Galvanic Carbines get them 3 attacks at strength 4 with devastating wounds at 18 inches. And in melee they get 4 attacks per piece with their cavalry sabers at strength 4 AP 0. Their special rule is quite a nice one in Tatska Oblika. This one allows them to do a reactive move if the enemy unit comes too close, getting to move D6 inches or a full 6 inches if there's a battle line unit nearby. Maybe not the worst to backpedal from charges or hide behind terrain. Overall quite nice skirmish dog horses that are pretty good for throwing forward towards the enemy. Definitely a solid option, maybe in some smaller numbers alongside things like the Infiltrators to have a bit of early mid-board presence. Then we have their Vanguard style build in the Cerberus Sulphur Hounds. These ones were a little bit cheaper pre-codex at 55 points per 3 of them and they have a similar sort of stat line. Again they hit the enemy with quite a broad array of different close range and sort of low to mid strength attacks with low AP and damage 1. The dog horses get their sulfur breath attacks which are basically flamers with strength 3, AP 1 and 9 inch range. And then with the rest of them you get the options of a phosphor blast carbine, architect pistols or paired phosphor pistols. The sergeant getting a cavalry arc maul. Games Workshop do appear to have tweaked the rules on their pistols slightly, giving them the option of an architect pistol with strength 6 and AP minus 1 and devastating wounds. But overall I wouldn't really say that their role has changed very much there. 
Otherwise, their second small change came to their line breakers rule, and it's got very slightly worse in a similar sort of way to the assault marines one. These ones are mortal wound impact hits on the charge. For each model in the unit, you roll a 4 plus to deal a mortal wound to the enemy unit that you've charged into, going off on a 2 plus if you're next to a battle line unit. The difference with this one is that you now have to be in engagement range to be able to trigger those. You can't just have the cavalry all over the place. And with at least fairly big bases, that probably is going to limit the sort of output it could get, at least for bigger units of them. Overall took a bit of a hit, they're not really enormously durable per point, costing similar to the cheaper Taraxi and the Sicarians, plus maybe being a little bit more likely to be exposed than them, as they'll have to move round terrain, not through it, as they move up the board. Probably a bit much to ask for a unit that's only really very good at bullying lighter infantry, but at least they do do that kind of well. Electro Priest next, and first up we have the Corpus Gari. They've gained the Cult Mechanicus keyword, and in a shocking move they've stolen the special rule of the Taraxi Sterilizers, the one that meant you were able to slow down an enemy unit, nominating one enemy unit that they've hit with their shooting attacks, handy enough to maybe try and keep one unit out of the fight. I guess perhaps the problem with that is they're still going to have at least a reasonable chance of catching the Electro Priest, as to actually trigger the rule they have to have been within 12 inches in the first place. Still, I guess it could credibly stop a slower unit from being able to charge them, though. Otherwise, they'll generally stack a lot of saves on whatever they throw their gauntlets at. Three attacks hitting on threes with sustained hits two, strength five, AP zero, and damage one, and then a similar sort of profile in melee, but only hitting on fours. Between shooting and a charge, they will absolutely destroy a bunch of hordes, though they will generally die quite easily in return. They're only toughness three with a five plus invulnerable save and a five plus feel no pain, which isn't really going to be too good against volume fire. Having their special rule changed as well means that they don't get the minus one to wound rolls for enemy units targeting them when they've got a character leading them. They're also one of the units that doesn't get doctrine or imperatives as well, as I guess they're more of the commanders as opposed to the things that get programmed. Overall still might be cheap enough to be interesting as a dune rider threat unit, jumping out to zap some hordes. Like many of these squads though, kind of limited capacity to punch up against things with higher saves or high toughness. I guess a few of the different attachments could help out with that a little bit. Things that give them either extra AP or re-rolling wound rolls are particularly nice. Next we've got the Fulgurites, so the melee version of these. Previously it was 60 points for 5 of them, the similar sort of stat line and they retain that special rule where it's minus 1 to wound them if they're led by a character, but I still don't think that quite gets them to the position of actually being durable when they're only toughness 3 to start with. Their Electro Leech staves get them 2 attacks at strength 6, AP minus 1 and damage 2 with devastating wounds. Not really considered to be quite scary enough to be general purpose damage dealers given how fragile they are. Though a big unit of 10 of them really isn't too awful charging in if you can get the jump on the enemy. They'd average around about 5 or 6 dead marines or around about 3 dead space marine terminators which isn't nothing. Devastating wounds at least makes them fairly general purpose and if you were using the plus 1 attack and strength boost out of the data psalm conclave then they do actually go to being quite scary I think. 3 attacks at strength 7 feels like a whole world of difference. You could certainly have a list with some enormously punchy fulgurites and cataphron breaches in. Moving on to vehicles next, I thought we'd start with the chunky and punchy Castellan robots. They're brought in in units of 2-4 to four, and each individual one was 100 points pre-codex. Getting you a 7 wound monster with toughness 9, a 2 plus save and a 5 plus invulnerable. As mentioned, the weapon stats were flipped around a bit. The Heavy Fossil Blaster is now the one that gets more damage. It was kind of weird that there was one with less AP but more damage in the unit. The Heavy one is now 3 attacks at Strength 6, AP 1 and Damage 2. And the regular ones are all Strength 6, AP 1 and Damage 1. Which perhaps feels like it makes a bit more sense. The Heavy one might be a bit more of a rival for the Incendine Combustor now. I feel like for loadouts you probably want at least one Castellan Fist, as their melee is rather fearsome with 4 attacks at strength 12, AP 2 and damage 3. And then otherwise I feel like there's arguments you could make for pretty much any of the other loadouts. Dual Fists for reroll wounds is fairly scary. But I think I'd probably prefer the regular Phosphor Blaster and then the Combuster or the Heavy one on top. They have their fun special rule where on a 6 they reflect back a mortal wound against the enemy unit that shot them, which could be kind of fun for chip damage, and occasionally could just mean that the enemy really doesn't want to fire at them, particularly with weapons with low AP that you're probably going to lose as many wounds as these guys do. Obviously they're going to be interesting in the Cybernetica cohort, 
being able to advance, fire off the various different types of guns and not lose any movement towards getting a charge is quite big due to being able to get the Conqueror Doctrine. I feel like the real improvement to the unit came from all the changes to the Cybernetica Datasmith before though, who did feel a bit sad in that he was kind of underwhelming for even his cheap points cost previously. He's a minor tech priest character with just three wounds, has a fancy pistol and a two attack power fist, but he's mainly there to put the floppy disks in the Castellan robots, programming them to be either extra tough or get extra attacks at range or in melee. He's seen lots of different improvements, now the Castellan robots get to start in plus one toughness in Aegis Protocol from the start of the game. Really nice if you're going second, as that means that they're going to be a little bit tougher against enemy firepower. But perhaps more importantly, you no longer have to test leadership to be able to change the protocol from one to another, so they're just quite reliable for doing that. I did quite like the idea that they were sort of hard and tricky to reprogram, but it did mean that the rule was just kind of weak and super unreliable. And finally, as quite a nice quality of life type thing, he gained a special rule to stop him counting as having the infantry keyword if he is in a unit of Castellan robots, which he has to lead anyway. So units attacking the units with the anti-infantry keyword won't be wounding the units weirdly easily with, say, poison weapons from the Drukhari. Overall, seems pretty solid, and even if points stay the exact same, this definitely looks like an improvement for the Castellan robots all around. I think it will be really quite nice if Games Workshop managed to get them to a place where they're another really credible mainline damage dealer with fun synergies and things, perhaps as a rival to the Catafron Servitors that seem the other obvious choice. This guy is a tech priest, so it means that you can bear enhancements for them. Next up, we come to the Chicken Walkers, and we'll start with the Iron Strider de Ballistari, another unit considered one of the stronger units for the Codex. Previously, they were really quite cheap walkers at 50 points per. And broadly, these have been kept the same. Games Workshop just tweaked their special rule a bit to give them advanced keywords, which will be kind of handy in Protector, I guess. Unless their cost changes massively, they were fairly durable per the point. Toughness 7, a 3 plus save, 7 wounds, and a 5 plus invulnerable. That's some serious wounds and toughness on the table per point there. They move pretty quickly at 10 inches, and then had the choice of either the Twin Cognis Auto Cannon or the Twin Cognis Last Cannon. Both getting the Twin Links keyword over the more standard stat line, and also sustained hits 1 for Cognis, I guess. Just in general, they tended to be pretty annoying, tough units to soak a bunch of enemy firepower, and really quite good ones to have skirmishing with the enemy, while dealing some actually good anti-tank firepower. Their special rule has only been changed slightly, basically they used to previously have the ability to fall back and charge, now their special rule is just entirely shooting, they can fall back and shoot, advance and shoot, and you can re-roll desperate escape tests. I suppose advance and shoot is something that you might often have anyway from Conqueror Doctrina, though I guess it's handy enough to have even if you're going to be in Protector. At least theoretically you could make quite a threatening unit of these, three of them that are just really quite tough for the cost, and then three big punchy last cannon shots with sustained hits. That feels like it probably gets to a point where it could be interesting enough as a target for certain stratagems, anything that makes last cannons more dangerous. They're pretty nice in the Skitari cohort as well. Stealth makes these guys even more annoying to kill. Otherwise, for motive walkers, we have the Sidonian Dragoons. These have been split into the two data sheets, one of them with the Taser Lancers, as you can see here, and one of them with the Radium Jezail, the sniper option that was very rarely taken. Previously, these were 60 points each, so a little bit more expensive than the Iron Striders, and even with that slightly increased points cost, they were still very tanky for the cost. They also had built-in stealth just on their core rule as well, which at least against ranged attacks maybe makes up for the difference versus the Iron Strider. Otherwise, the Taser Lance isn't very changed. It's still 4 attacks at Strength 7, AP 2 and Damage 2, hitting on a 4 plus with sustained hits 2, the Lance keyword for plus 1 to wound, and Anti-Walker 2 plus just in case you were jousting with some enemy knights or something. Otherwise, it still gets a punchy pistol shot with a Phosphor Serpenta, and as mentioned, its version of the Iron Strider type rule, instead of focusing on shooting, is entirely melee. It also did pick up advance and charge, so that's a massive boost to this guy's threat range. Despite having a bunch of fancy keywords, I still say it's probably not standout good in terms of melee damage. Though I think a unit of two or three of them probably has enough combined threats to actually wipe out most medium tier squads. And it feels like it's got some fun options in several of the detachments. Pretty good with the Hunter Cohort, it can get a 5 plus feel no pain, or pretty nice with Cybernetica Cohort, giving it a big 5 inch charge threat range on average with that big stratagem. I feel like with Advance and Charge this thing is looking a lot more interesting. 
Otherwise, the alternative data sheet for this one is the one with the radium Jezel. This one passes up the big damage of the taser lance for that single anti-infantry shot of the radium Jezel. One shot at strength 5, AP minus 2 and damage 3 with anti-infantry, heavy and precision. Again, I feel like this one is just realistically not going to be good damage for the points, even with its special rule to boost it, which is called Hunters. Select one enemy unit at the start of the battle, and you get to re-roll the hit roll against that unit for the rest of the game. Feels like it could be kind of a fun spooky rule though. I feel like if you declare this against one of your opponent's character units, it might at least make that character think twice about exposing itself, even if in reality the damage output of this thing still isn't very good or very reliable. I feel like perhaps the most interesting thing of this one is likely to be the durability per cost. Given that it's got less threat than the Iron Strider or the Dragoon, it might well cost a little bit less. And if so, that could be just a pretty interesting utility unit to force the opponent to have to deal with a whole bunch of really quite tough wounds. Though if it does still somehow cost the same as the rest of them, then it's probably going to be in second place by quite some margin. Both flavours of the Sidonian Dragoon also gains the Smoke keyword as well, which I guess could be relevant for pop-up cover if desperately needed. They already have stealth. And again, that could be helpful for the Explorator Maniple with the stealth for a unit near one of these. Next, we've got the Skitari Walking Tank that is the Onager Dune Crawler, 140 points worth of Walker. And in general, I think that this one was generally a bit tougher compared with being more dangerous. 11 wounds at toughness 10 with a big 4 plus invulnerable save and a 2 plus regular save. Between those, it's just not particularly easy to take out either with particularly high AP anti tank guns or low AP ones. It still gets really quite an array of different options. You've got the Eradication Beamer, Phosphor Blaster, Neutron Laser or Icarus Array. I'd probably rate the Neutron Laser or the Icarus Array as maybe the ones to go for out of those. The other two are either low damage or short range. For the datasheet changes, its smoke keyword was moved around a little bit. It now gets that base and the option to trade out for the data tether is an upgrade. It still basically amounts to the same thing though. And I must admit, I did quite like the fun factor of its special rule. The Emanatus Force Field means that battle line units within 6 inches of it gain a 4 plus invulnerable save against ranged attacks. That one replaces its curious sort of rule to move over terrain pieces that are less than 4 inches high. In reality I think the Fun Force Field rule I think maybe isn't that impactful realistically. I guess perhaps has a little bit of synergy for this guy advancing alongside some vanguard towards the midfield with the vanguard helping out other Skitari units in turn. But you still are only going from a 5 plus and vulnerable save anyway to a 4 plus which makes it a little bit less standout. Kind of depends on what tables you played on for the other rule. I think a lot of the time I just really wouldn't have raced it all that much though. There's loads of ruins out there that it wouldn't have let you clear with that and even then it might have struggled with its big base. Overall, I think it's still kind of fine as a big gun to have in the backfield, though. Kind of tough and hopefully should survive for a few rounds of shooting, and the change to the Tet Priest engine seer might see it be a little bit more interesting for people, now that you can give it a 5 plus feel no pain, as it was kind of weird having the invulnerable save boost being basically redundant on one of the Skitari's main battle tanks, one of the two units you'd really want to use it on. For the other battle tank, we've got the Hovercraft Scorpius Disintegrator, this one was 180 points before, and a similar sort of stat line to the Onager at toughness 10 with a 2 plus save, but lacking the invulnerable. The Scorpius gets a fair few stubber shots, a few fairly nicely general purpose disruptor missiles that are fairly effective regardless of target, and then either a Belaros energy cannon, and then either a Belaros energy cannon for some ignores line of sight, or a ferromite cannon for some strength 12 anti-tank shooting. The Belaros gets a plus 1 to hit against infantry, and the Ferromite against monsters and vehicles. Overall being one of the biggest and most expensive vehicle units in the book, I think it's interesting enough as the target of stratagems, and could be quite a fun one for the Tet Priest engines here to help out with his feel no pain and healing. It perhaps looks like a good target for the buffs of the Cohort Cybernetica, and might be nice enough for the Swapper Deltrina option for the Hunter Cohort. After the two I've seen maybe the Ferromite cannon used a bit more compared with the Belaros cannon to help with anti-tank things, Again, hopefully it could be quite nice if Games Workshop could get this to a place where it was a credible alternative to Cataphrons for mainline damage dealing. The Hovercraft Landing Craft Transport is the Scorpius Dune Rider. This one was 80 points previously, and it's a bit less tough than the Disintegrator with its enclosed carapace. This one's only toughness 9, a 3 plus save, and 11 wounds, but that's still not bad durability for the cheap cost. It can transport 12 infantry models, though not Cataphrons, 
and does pretty much put out a squad's worth of firepower at close range as well. The Cogniz Heavy Stover Array gets 18 shots within 18 inches, and all those shots have sustained hits 1, and now the Twin Links keyword as well, which is quite a nice boost. It should be stacking a fair amount of saves on enemy light stuff. Otherwise, it lost its rule for advancing and being able to drop a unit, which does limit its range a little bit, and that was kind of annoying as that was kind of usable in the Conqueror Doctrine, as he could still fire. It swaps that one out for a Razorback style rule, where if it fires at the same thing as the thing that it just dropped out of it, then the unit that disembarks can reroll wounds in the shooting phase. It also gained the smoke keyword, which is handy enough, and it feels like it has more boosts and options in the Explorator mana pool compared with most. Overall, I think it's definitely looking pretty interesting. Could be used to get Electro Priest to the front lines. I guess maybe you could have it as a battlefield bunker for Fulgurite Priest to get out if you're playing with a melee version of the Data Psalm Conclave too. Archaeopters next, and the bat-winged flyers of the Mechanicus are Toughness 9, 10 wounds and a 3 plus save. Generally I'd rate them as pretty expensive for their defensive profile, unless things get a lot cheaper. The Fuselave gets the Cognis Heavy Stubber Array that was already twin-linked, so I guess that's now the same between that and the Scorpius Dune Rider. It's a flyer with the hover keyword, so it could be moving 20 inches per turn. I feel like you probably do want to start this on the board, and its primary rule is the Bomb Rack, when it finishes a normal move, if it moves across an enemy unit, roll 66 on each 4+, plus, it takes a mortal wound. Unfortunately, that is reduced compared with previously though. That used to be a 3+, plus, now it's just a 4. Though all the Archaeopters got a subtle improvement in no longer degrading at 3 wounds or less, so they won't be taking the minus 1 to hit. Overall, I think it's a nerf though. Having a slightly worse bomb rack is not going to do this thing any favours. It won't really run all that much anyway, so without a big points cut, this one still isn't going to be that interesting, I think. Next, we've got the Stratoraptor. This one gets the same defensive profile and was a little bit more expensive. For firepower, it gets a twin LAS cannon, two stobbers, and two heavy phosphor blasters. These get the same upgraded profile as the Castellan robots, getting a damage 2 rather than damage 1, so quite a serious increase to its firepower there. The not degrading thing feels like it's a bit more helpful on this compared with the fusel lave as well. It gets a plus one to hit against non-fly units with its special rule, so a lot of that firepower is going to be pretty accurate most of the time. Overall, I feel like particularly with the damage two upgrade, this one took a really big step in the right direction. Unless the opponent's got some quite long-range anti-tank firepower, it might be able to hover sort of safe-ish in the backfield compared with the enemy and use its really good movement to keep safe. Certainly looks a bit more interesting. Still maybe not standout damage for the cost though, and it is rather fragile if the opponent does have some long-range anti-tank fire. Lastly for the planes, we've got the Archaeopter Transvector. This was 140 points before the Codex. The same stat line and the same heavy stubber array, and a transport capacity of 11, which is a lot more useful than it was in 9th edition. Its special rule feels like it's a bit of a dud though, really. It allows it to come in turn 1, 2, or 3. But given that that happens in the reinforcement step, then typically your units won't be able to disembark from the transport after that. So you probably just want to start on the board in hover mode and then just move 20 inches and disembark the squad to get something up really nice and close and personal straight away. The big movement is good though, but if it remains anywhere near this sort of points cost, it's just going to get outcompeted by the Dune Rider. I feel like it does actually have to be kind of close to the Dune Rider now to actually make it worth it. And currently at 60 points more, so I'm not too optimistic about it getting too close to that. Finally, we've got the Mechanicus characters, and leading the way is none other than Belisarius Core himself. 185 points pre codex, and must be the Warlord if taken. He's pretty tanky with toughness 8, a 2 plus save, 10 wounds, and a good invulnerable. He gets lone operative if he's within 3 inches of another Adeptus Mechanicus model. In theory, I guess that means that you could have the Sidonian Scatros give him lone operative, so they both are, but he could just do that with a unit that's hiding out of line of sight as well if you want it, so maybe it's not the biggest deal in the world. His attacks are the Solar Atomizer, D3 attacks at strength 14, AP4 and damage 3 at range, fairly punchy, and then a flurry of different mid-strength attacks in melee, at least somewhat threatening to anything standard space ruin size or weaker. Other than just gaining the Court Mechanicus keyword, the big change that he got was to his Canticles of the Omnisire, his aura buff that he gets to choose one of at the start of the battle round. 
He still gets a nice simple one for reroll hit rolls of one, which could be okay if you're building around an army that doesn't get innate hit rolls like cast from breaches perhaps, but it was Shroud's arm that maybe got the biggest change, changing from stealth to the benefit of cover. The benefit of cover could be quite nice in combination with Protector Doctrina, giving you some fantastically tanky things that were out in the open, though it maybe isn't too hard to get cover in 10th edition, so other than that, you could have argued stealth might have been better. Otherwise, there was a small, maybe not that meaningful tweak to his leadership ability. That's the one that's probably going to be rarely taken, unless you're just absolutely all out for objectives late game. That has now been changed to an aura of plus one to leadership tests, where previously it was re-roll the test, probably a little bit weaker overall. Before the codex came out, he really wasn't taken very much in Mechanicus list. I feel like he could definitely go down a fair bit in points and people wouldn't feel too bad. It would be nice to see the master of the machines get back on the table again. Otherwise, for the higher order tech priest, we've got the tech priest Dominus. He was 75 points pre-codex and a 4 wound tech priest with a 2 plus save and a 5 plus invulnerable. His main rule is to give his lead squad a 5 plus feel no pain type save, so that's pretty excellent on both types of cataphrons and makes him kind of redundant for the electro priests. Otherwise, for a leader character, he's perhaps got a fairly surprising amount of threats. He can fight at least fairly hard in combat with a bunch of strength 6 and damage 2 attacks, and then gets the choice between the Volkite or Eradication Beam and Macro Stubber versus Phosphor Serpenta. I think that the only datasheet change was that he gains the pistol keyword on the Phosphor Serpenta, but I feel like the Macro Stubber is probably still the way to go. His data spike attack in melee could threaten D6 wounds on an enemy vehicle, and that could be pretty big as well. Overall, I still rate him as a pretty strong choice to lead Cataphrons. Seems pretty good to include in either the Data Psalm Conclave or the Radcore. He could be a good bearer of either of the enhancements for sustained hits or stealth with that. Otherwise, perhaps his main rival for leading Cataphrons is the Tech Priest Manipulus. He was quite cheap at 55 points before, though it will be kind of sad that his Omni Sterilizer upgrade has been toned down so much. He didn't really change much besides gaining the Court Mechanicus keyword like the rest of the Tech Priests, and his primary buff is to give the unit that he's leading lethal hits and a once per game 4 plus invulnerable save. I guess best to trigger when you think you're about to take a key round of shooting. Lethal Hits is pretty nice though. It's pretty good on the Cataphron Destroyers with the Plasma. or the Breachers with the Arc Rifles makes them just very general purpose, even more so than before. And it has the choice of two different shooting attacks, a close range Transonic Cannon Flamer with devastating wounds, or a Magna Rail Lance with just one mid-strength damage three shots. Overall still quite a strong character I think. Given that he's so cheap, he's probably the better choice of the two, I'd say, to lead the Electro Priests or the Skitari Rangers or Vanguard. Otherwise, for the slightly more junior Tech Priest, first up we have the trusty Tech Priest Engine Seer. He's 40 points and only has 3 wounds and a 3 plus save. And as mentioned, his primary boost has been changed around. Previously, he'd give a vehicle heal D3 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save. Now he gives them heal D3 wounds and a 5 plus feel no pain. It's only to a vehicle model, not a vehicle unit, so you can't say select an entire unit of iron striders or something. But that still is really quite a good durability boost, usually going to be equating to them being 50% tougher. It's quite nice it actually now has a good effect on the Honor Jejun crawler, and it could be interesting enough on some Castellan robots advancing up the field as well. Even if you just put this on one of them, that means that one of them will be significantly harder to take down, and hopefully it could be the difference between one of them living or dying. Otherwise, for just 40 points, I think it's fairly good value for a character. He's got lone operative if he's within 3 inches of a vehicle. Has a snazzy devastating wounds pistol, and a few attacks at strength 6 and damage 2 in melee. And like his space marine tech marine cousins, he gets the nerd rage special rule, where if you break a vehicle that's within 12 inches of him, suddenly he gets 6 attacks with that omniscient axe, so that's 7 attacks total at that profile, which actually means that he's a pretty big threat to things like Space Marine squads. Really not too bad for a 40 point support character overall, I think. Otherwise, the Techno Archaeologist is the objective seeking tech priest. He's got the same Mechanicus pistol and fights in combat with a servo arc claw, perhaps slightly punchier than the engine seer with strength 8 and devastating wounds on that. And then he gives his squad two helpful objective claiming buffs, plus one to your objective control. And then also a deny deep strike special rule where you can't come in from reserves within 12 inches of him. That's particularly powerful as it trumps drop close special rules. So it could counter things like say space marine interceptors 
or things like Jean Stiller cults or Chaos Demon stratagems. Between those two, it does seem to be enough to have at least some people tempted to take him, maybe most often seen accompanying some rangers or vanguard into the midfield. Overall, his rules maybe aren't the most exciting in the world, but definitely gives a squad a pretty powerful boost towards claiming a point, and also protects them against battle shock as well with the plus one to objective control, meaning they'll always be at least objective control one, due to the way that modifying characteristics work. Finally, we have the very cheap and cheerful Skitari Marshall. He was previously just 35 points for a 3 wound character with a 5 plus invulnerable. Fighting with a bit of strength 6 AP minus 1 melee with his control stave. He'd be very relevant in the Skitari Hunter cohort as he is one of the ones that has to bear the enhancements there. He can only lead rangers and vanguard and his buff is to re-roll the hit roll for them. So often that's going to equate to a plus 50% boost to their firepower. He can also opt to target his unit with a stratagem even if it's been used elsewhere in the army for a phase. Might be helpful if you're playing a detachment that's got something that's particularly powerful on rangers or vanguard. Though in general compared with the base troops other things are often better targets. Though unfortunately he did lose his third special rule that was the control stave one. Which was the ability to use stratagems on his unit even if the unit is battle shocked. That was kind of niche to the point where I don't think many people would miss it. I do have kind of mixed feelings on this guy. He's definitely got good buffs for the character in himself, but it is just trying to make you use the Rangers or the Vanguard as a damage dealer unit. It might just have been better taking the points that you invested in this guy and putting them towards your next squad of Rangers or Vanguard if you wanted more of what they did. He does significantly add to their damage output. Could be usable enough jumping out of a Dune Rider maybe, but he doesn't add a whole load to their defence or their objective control. So anyway, with the characters talked about, that just about brings us to the end of our look at Codex Adeptus Mechanicus for 10th edition 40k. I feel like feelings about the book have been mixed so far, even if at time of recording we don't have points cost yet, so we can't really accurately say exactly how strong the book's going to be. Though I'd be sort of surprised if things changed too enormously from the previous values, I feel like there will be some wiggly of a few things up or down though. I feel like there'll be a bit of a mix between some really quite fun stuff and some disappointments. Doctrine and Imperative still only affecting a subset of the army is still maybe a little bit sad. Advance and Shoot is helpful enough for those that can get it though. The detachments I feel are all at least somewhat balanced and at least somewhat interesting. Though a bunch of them seem to make you really heavily have to just use certain units in the army. And that's maybe kind of hard to do in an army that doesn't have that many different subsets of data sheets. And it's quite expensive to collect so you don't really want to be building up enormous amounts of skew lists in my opinion. I do like that they've buffed the Radzone Cohort's Bombardment, though it's a shame that the Omni Sterilizer and the Return Fire went back. And out of the rest, maybe the Skitari Hunter Cohort is perhaps one of my favourites. I can't help but think that a list that's heavy in Fulgurite Electro Priests and Breachers could be kind of fun to run in Data Sarm Conclave with the melee boost as well. Not sure if it'd necessarily be enormously competitive, but it does seem like some pretty hilarious punchy ab mech. For the new data sheets, kind of a little bit underwhelming that the Sidonian Scatros doesn't have a bit more threat with that sniper rifle, or wasn't necessarily expecting him to be a stellar damage dealer, but might have been nice to give him just a little bit more for his hunting character's role. I feel like he'd need to be very cheap to be particularly tempting for actual damage at the moment. Otherwise for data sheets, again a bit of a mixed bag. I think my favourite changes are the ones to the Castell and Roadbots, the Dune Riders and the Tet Priest Engines here. All of those feel like they've had some new life breathed into them. And Advance and Charge Taser Dragoons does seem fun as well. Perhaps a bit disappointing that the other Skitari Elite Infantry, Cavalry and Jump Troops aren't either a little bit more durable or a little bit more threatening. I guess they're probably still going to be remaining very cheap points wise. In any case though, let me know what you make of the Codex, which bits do you like and dislike about the changes, and if you're going to build around one of these detachments for an Abmech army, which one would you go for and why? Look forward to hearing all your thoughts down in the comments as always. In any case, if you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Auspect's Tactics. I'll certainly aim to cover the Admech points updates when we get those in the digital download. It will allow us to actually put the codex into context a bit and think about building some army lists. I've also done a bit more of a focused review of the Sidonian Scatros as well on the channel, so feel free to give that a watch later if you'd like. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspect's Tactics does have a Patreon page, which is the main way that I can continue making all these videos quite so regularly, 
So if you are enjoying quite a bit, any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.